All right, we are live. I'm with Bob Horn, Bill Kamek, and Matthew Weiss to start. Um, Bob Bob Horn is on the hot seat. We're gonna put him through hell. <laughs> um, Bob, tell us what you're working on, and yeah, first just tell us what you're working on right now. What you got going on that you can actually talk about? Okay, uh, right now I am finishing. I have uh, two more songs for. Uh, this artist named Paulini, she's out of Australia. She won uh, the Australian Idol a couple years ago. And um, she's a kind of Beyonce-type artist, real phenomenal singer. Um, she's Fijian. Uh, and uh, finishing that up, got two more songs on that. I just finished four songs for Stali on Atlantic. And I've uh, been trying to finish Lupe Fiasco's album for months now. I don't know when that'll get finished, but we keep working on it. <laughs> so that's uh, that's kind of ongoing. And then uh, the other thing I've been working on was um, this group out of Sa San Diego called Mayfield. They're like a rock folk kind of band. So basically those four things have been what I've been doing lately. You're, you're recording, Lupe? Uh no, actually, my partner Eric uh, in the other control room he records Lupe, and I'm I've been mixing. So he comes in. It's all in the same studio. Eric Eric records him, then you mixing tag team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's actually been almost uh, ten months now. We've been doing that with him. And you guys couldn't invite him to the barbecue for uh, <laughs> the Fourth of July, so we my crew could meet him, huh? <laughs> I don't know. He's kind of. He's kind of a funny guy with that stuff. Fourth of July, yeah, I know. I already know. Um, okay. Um, I've been jamming. I told you, I've been jamming this song by Mario. Um, Here we go again. Us, huh? Here we go again? Or here yeah. I go again? Here yeah. I go again. Tell me... Okay, bro, I did not know you were actually a musician that got on tracks and jammed. So you played guitar and bass on that. You recorded what? I recorded, uh, well, I did. I recorded the track. I played guitar and bass, and then I recorded Mario's vocals. So you and, recorded uh, all of Mario's vocals? Yeah. yeah. That, that track was actually made for Michael Jackson. Um, Are you serious? Yeah, we made that for Michael in Miami. We were there for about a month just cranking out the tracks for Michael. It was uh, 2004, I think, 2004 or five. And um, that ended up being the ones Michael kind of took too long deciding if he wanted it, and Mario wanted it, and that was for a producer named Ron Feemster, who went by also went by nephew, and uh, so he ended up selling it to Mario, and it became uh, that song. Here, here I go again, and I, I used to play a lot of guitar and bass for nephew stuff. He would just be creating tracks on the MPC, and if you heard a guitar part or a bass part, he just hand me the bass and <laughs> start singing what he wanted or letting me come up with grooves and uh, just add it to the track that he was working on in progress. Did you guys have an actual um, name as far as a team? Uh, yeah, it was called the Drama Family. Um, yeah, we, were, we worked for about five years together. So I engineered, mixed most of what he did, and uh, played a lot of the guitar and bass stuff that he had on his records. Is that the kind of music you were looking to do when you left Nashville? Uh, kind of, yeah. I, I when I left Nashville, I was burnt out on the country and Christian thing because it just felt like I was working on the same song every day, even though the artist would change. It just all felt the same, and uh, I was really getting into R&B at the time, so I was I was happy to work on that stuff when I got out here. So. You say you were you were in the R&B at the time. Were you in R&B into R&B before you went to Nashville? Uh, no, actually, funny enough. Nashville radio stations, they had one station I liked, and they played a lot of, I think at the time, TLC, No Scrubs was hot back then, and, uh, you know, that kind of, that era, and uh, I just started getting into it and buying all the CDs, and and then I had to come out to L.A., so. <laughs> what I actually thought you were going to say is you were into hardcore hip-hop, KRS-One, and... <laughs> uh, no, that stuff I, I didn't really work on or discover until I got out here, so... Okay, now you're you said drama family, right? Yeah. That was you, nephew, and who? Uh there was two other producers, Mansoor Zafar and 
uh, Brian Reed and uh, Brian had a few cuts on Neo and uh, some other stuff, but uh, mostly it was it was for nephew. So I, I would work with him every single day. Um, one second, every we got several people coming in. As you guys come in, mute yourselves, um, and or one of us will mute you guys when you guys first come in. Um, okay, so. You doing that type, you actually getting into composing, because I'm looking and when I first saw it, I thought there was an error. I saw Barry Manilow, Barry Manilow, Barry Manilow composing. Yeah, that's completely wrong. Right. I was, I was huh? in the room when, when that credit <laughs> was made. I what wasn't did, born. What did that's you gotta, do? That's got to be another Bob Horn, and all music is just, they're, they're difficult. Okay. To all right, because, yeah, there's a Bob Horn, it says tenor. And he's a saxophonist. I just because I kept looking, I was looking hard, and then I saw Bob the Builder Horn. Right. That's why I had to ask you. I'm like, hold on, man. Are you Bob the Builder Horn? Is this supposed to be a secret or something? Um. So why did they call you Bob the Builder Horn? Why did your team call you Bob the Builder Horn? I don't know. I guess because the cartoon was popular at the time, and they they thought of it like I was building mixes and stuff like that, and helping them build the tracks. So that was their. They're my little hip hop nickname for me at the time. Uh, I think it made it onto a few albums like Neo and. It made it on several because because when yeah. I was searching for you, your credits and the other Bobs were mingled mixed together, and then Bob the Builder horn popped up, and I just I was like Bob the Builder. I clicked on it and I saw these. I saw Mario, which I saw the plaque on your wall at um, right. Echo Bar, and I'm looking. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. That's that's actually Bob. And I went through and I saw it was like 12 tracks under Bob the Builder. And um, that's why I had to ask you about it. Yeah, but the Barry Manilow thing, that's thats a different Bob Horn. Uh, I wasn't even born when <laughs> he was working. Yeah, I'm looking at it. I'm like, uh, this, don't, this don't seem to match. But um, do you miss? Do you miss actually doing the production like you were doing with ne Nephew? Not really. Um, I prefer... Now that I've gotten in, gotten into like ninety percent mixing and maybe only ten percent or less recording, I, I kind of enjoy it. I just I love the fact that I can be alone for the most part of a day and and be creative with a song and then come together with the artist later in the evening and or the next day and you know get their take on it and it's I kind of enjoy that more than recording. I I enjoy recording if it's like a band situation. I got a lot of microphones and. That's kind of fun, you know, because you get you get like five or six guys and they're having a good time. Um, but just you know, dumping tracks from the NPCs and and logic and organizing and arranging tracks and then recording vocals, that kind of got old after after many years. What about uh, you playing bass and guitar on tracks? That was cool, uh, bro. It, you're jamming on this track. You're jamming. <laughs> you guys are jamming. That was that was definitely a, a bonus perk to it, and it and it made me more valuable to him as a producer. It was it was harder to for him to use another engineer because I I had offered tried to offer as many things as I could when I worked with him. So yeah. Okay, but but you are you going to get back into that? I, I love producing myself. Um, I I probably wouldn't engineer for a producer anymore I'd, I'd, I'd rather just mix for a producer so that's been my focus for the last six years okay yeah. all right <clears throat> I've got a whole list of questions over here but I'm gonna hold off um, Eric Riker I'm gonna ask a couple of things and I'm gonna pass it off to the guys uh, what's Eric Riker up to uh, Eric he's he just finished an Australian rock band named Tracer they flew out here to um, have he co-produced and engineered and mixed their album, and he just finished the last mix I think two days ago, and uh, I don't know what he's starting today. I haven't I haven't really talked to him yet today, but uh, he just finished Tracer's album. It's their they're similar to like Soundgarden, really really cool stuff, really cool guys. So he just knocked that out. Okay, I've got one technical question, and then who, whichever one of you guys want to come up next. Message me in the box over there and let me know, um, and then you'll be next. Um, on Dave Pensado's show, you talked about uh, using limiters, compressors. Uh, the first comp, would you'd hit it 
harder than the ones after the first comp or limiter you would hit harder than the ones after um, and the first thing that was okay do you use low ratio compression and if so how low of a ratio do you use yeah I, I typically never use high ratio compression um, if I want more compression I'll just use more threshold or more input drive um, my ratios I never really go above four to four to one. I, I really like one and a half to one, two to one, three to one, and I use four to one on the eleven seventy six just because it's the lowest one on there. But I, I like to do more gain reduction and more threshold rather than more ratio. So you use a lower ratio and then dig into the signal more. Yeah, it's more transparent that way, so you can get a lot more compression, a lot more level riding uh, if you're trying to kind of get an automatic vocal ride going so you don't have to do so much fader work. If you can find a transparent compressor um, doing more gain reduction than a higher ratio is always going to be more clear. If you do a high ratio and less threshold, it's going to snap harder and bounce and pump and sound bad. So for those who have pumping issues, they can lower the, ra lower the ratio. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So, lower ratio, dig into the signal. You look for a transparent compressor. Um, use it as a vocal writer. I tend to use release because I want to smooth it out. Like, I'll do the slowest release so that I can smooth it out, less transient stuff jabbing at me. You use a faster release, even on that one, to bring the, the vocal forward? Uh, yeah, the fastest release possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, two opposite ends of the spectrum. All right, so um, who has the first? Who wants the first question? Since nobody typed it in, it's probably Dwayne. I'll just call you out, Dwayne. Anyway, you, you just well, I just I just got back. I don't want to take you guys. Just you, people have been waiting. I'll I'll hand off. <laughs> I was waiting. Go ahead, I was in introducing to what you do. Go ahead, do your thing. Oh, okay. Well, here it is. Uh, my name is Dwayne from Toronto. Hi, just joined. Um, I am curious, uh, before I delve into my technical questions, I just want to talk to you about you, the person, Bob. What keeps you going after a, such a successful career? What's your next challenge? What, what, what do you wake up for? Well, I guess... What keeps me driven is that I don't I don't necessarily. On one hand, I don't feel like I've I've been as successful as I want to be, and and I do have those moments where I look back and be like, wow, I've been blessed. I've been able to do music for a living, and uh, not be homeless most of the time, and <laughs> you know. And, um, but at the same time, you know, I I hope to achieve what like Dave Pensado and Manny Manny Marquin have achieved, like on that kind of level mixing big singles all the time, you know, so that's, I'm still striving towards that, so, um, and I just love music, man, and especially when I get to mix something good, I, I mix roughly 300 songs a year or more, and, you know, sometimes 80% of those are, are mediocre, <laughs> that's just the way it is with us, we, we mix so much stuff that never sees the light of day, sometimes we mix amazing things that no one ever hears, and I guess the drive is just to, hope you work on something that you really love that then the whole world ends up enjoying. That's, that's the great thing when something you weren't expecting to turn big or you were hoping to turn big actually goes big. So that, that keeps me moving. Um, um, perfectly answered. Thank you. Um, that's your, that's kind of deals with your present and your future. Uh, can I go back to the moment where it turned around for you? Turned around. We, um, yeah, like we've all had those moments at uh, lower levels where you're sitting and you're mixing and it seems like it's you're running around in a rut and you want to give up. Uh, can you talk about ever having to deal with a, a personal challenge where that was with you? Um, or have you had the, the fortune of never ever having that? I, I think I've had... Uh... I've had periods where I wasn't sure what was going to come next and if it if things were going to escalate or go down or up or stay the way they were and um you know you you get 
you, I might be on a lull where I, I feel like I haven't had a great project in a while, and suddenly I get one, and then that kind of that kind of reinvigorates me and uh, wakes me up again. And I think a big transition was moving out here from the East Coast. Um, not sure if I was gonna find work or who I was gonna work with coming to a city where I I only knew a couple people and they weren't really able to help me uh, because they're in just different fields and stuff. So. Um, and I, a couple of them were able to help me, but it, that was definitely scary and uh, definitely transition after I'd already kind of started the ladder. Felt like I was starting back again. Um, and then, of course, building my own studio, that was a scary step. Um, wasn't sure if that was going to work out, and it's been four years now, and actually it's, it's, it seems like it's, it's going to be okay. So. Thank you again. Uh, does anyone else want to jump in here, or do I, I hit him with the third? Hold on. Let Matthew... Wait, no, wait. Matthew, you have time, right? Matthew has time. Go ahead. All right. Um, and my third of this this past, present, future uh, question, now in your own studio, you've gotten your own... Um, you've formulated your own workflow, your own habits... Uh, how do you keep so current and not get stuck with what you've done that's worked for you for so long? Um, the biggest thing is not using presets, honestly, not using templates. Um, I find when I when I do that, when I set up a template and I use it every day, I'll end up, things sound good, so I'll end up using the same reverb on the vocal every day and uh, same plugins on on kick and snare and stuff. So I, I take those extra seconds, which add up to minutes or hours through the day to literally start from scratch every, every song, even if it's on the same album. The only time I won't do that is maybe a rock album where I'll, I'll kind of copy some of the drum sounds from song to song. But um, yeah, I just, number one, listening to as much music as possible in between mixing and, Checking out Spotify, seeing what's new on iTunes the homepage, um, and then trying to imagine where people are going. Talking to people like Dave Pensado. Dave, Dave's an opposite guy, so anytime people are really into delays, he stops using delays. And then, <clears throat> so I've just tried to kind of incorporate some of those ideas of trying to look ahead six months when the song actually will probably be out and people will be hearing it, and. Um, just trying to give a sound that's sounds familiar to right now, but maybe different in one or two ways, you know. Again, I'm I'm just I'm gonna keep saying this because I, I tend to take over with my questioning. Anyone? No, 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 no takers. Okay. Um, we, know to, we know how to cut you off, bro. All right. right. <laughs> um, I had a follow up in that, and it was give me a minute. How do you – let me rephrase this. How do you not get caught up in trends in your mixing? Is, is it just you, – you said you were speaking to other people, so do you instantly hear something and be like, oh, i got to try that? Or is it more the feel of the song? Or do you experiment on something else and then bring it to uh, a, a substantial record? Like, I'm trying to disseminate how you take in new things. How, how do you share that to other people? So that we there's always that new plugin. There's always that new sound. So right. when do you know when to use it and when not to? Well, as far as translating what ends what the song ends up sounding, that's just me. When I first hear the song, I instantly hear the finished product in my head or something close to it. So then I just spend the whole rest of the day trying to achieve that. And if I have a new plugin and it kind of inspires something, uh, you know, that can happen. But I, I really don't concentrate on trying to give something new to the public or to the song. I really like the song kind of speak to me. And if something feels dry and I lean that way, if something feels wet, I'll, I'll go that way. Sometimes I'll, I'll try every way I can think possible to do something and pick the best out of those three or four. Um, so it's more just letting the song speak to me and, and try to guide me in what I think sounds best for that song. 
And you also said that some songs don't see the light of day. How do you deal with that? Or is it just, eh, so, well, I got other stuff. It sucks because there's, there's so many great artists out there, and it doesn't matter if they're major label and have a million-dollar deal or if they're indie. Sometimes they just they don't come out either. Uh, you have horrible situations with record labels where an artist was a tax write-off and only a couple people knew that at the label, the, the evil people, and their album was never going to come out, but yet everyone's working on it and putting their heart into it. That's horrible. And then uh, sometimes you got the indie that you're really rooting for and they've got great music and, and they're spending all their cash. And um, I got one now, man. I really hope this kid, uh, this guy, Sam Lee, I hope he can break through. He's a phenomenal artist. He's got that kind of John Mayer crooner type of voice, but in his own kind of musical way. And um, I'm hoping the best for him. So it's just, I don't know. Five years from now, I could be like, oh, he was another one that never made it, or or maybe he'll be the next John Mayer. Who knows? Fingers crossed. And you're, uh, you might not be able to answer this question, so feel free to just be like, mm, no. Uh, how? What's your selection process of choosing your projects? Is it the, I have to love the song, or is a mixing challenge? Do you like to delve? You have R&B and hip-hop. I got some technical questions with that coming later, but is what, what's that? You know, I, I don't really audition songs. Um, I know some people do that, or they have their managers do that. Um, I don't really audition projects if they. I kind of let. I, I have a certain rate, which kind of keeps out the. I don't know what you would call it, the riffraff, <laughs> you know, whatever, and then. Uh, everything's by recommendation or word of mouth. So if you get rec recommended from a project you just did that was good, uh, you know, with good people and, and people you trust and, and even better friends, you know that they're recommending a good project to you or something that's at least going to be decent. So I don't really bother with auditioning and turning stuff down like that. It's just if uh, um, I kind of feel them out with the phone conversation and talk about the music and, um, if, if we seem like a good fit, we'll take a meeting, maybe listen to a few things and, and go from there. Um, yeah, but I don't really, I don't really turn too many people away if I have the time to work on them. Usually it's a, it's either a time thing or a budget thing if I don't work for somebody. All right. I saw, we saw Khalid just join in here and I know you always have a few words to say, or is it just, you just watching today? Click on mute. Unmute, click on mute. Good, click. Yeah, I'm hanging in today. Um, wanted to jump in and um, uh, hang out with the legend over there too. What's up, man? Nice to meet you, Bob. Nice to meet you. How you doing? Doing great, man. Doing great. Um, definitely had to be on this one. Right, cool. Thanks. You want to keep going? Well, click. Did you have any I'll, questions for him I'll real quick? My barrage. <laughs> Say that again. Did you have any questions for him real quick? I just got in, so I'm just kind of seeing what's going on. Okay. Um, Continue. Hold on. hold on one second, Dwayne. <laughs> now, now, Bob, you, you, you see how Dwayne does our guests? Yeah. You guys come on, and if you're half awake, he'll get you. <laughs> he, he, uh, like Bill said over to the right, he should get paid for stuff like this. Dwayne comes in, and he brings it. Um, <laughs> Morris Mingle has joined us. Morris, you there? I hey man, and I got a question for you, Ma. Where are you at right now? I love this. I love the rack behind you. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I got this contract in. Now let me quit lying. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Brian, one of our Pensadian brothers. He he's having a grandchild, and so I'm studio sitting. He asked me would I come and watch the studio. I said yes. So me and Harold came out here. We grabbed the artist Ruby Red. We've been using his gear. I'm always talking about I like the art. Um, the, I like Art's gear, and he has the Art MPA2, the digital. Mm -hmm. And swap the tubes out. He said they were only 15 bucks. And I like this gear. I like Art. And and we have the reactor, the blue reactor. Uh -huh. I think Technica and Blue are my favorite companies for mics. And I'm just, I'm like sitting in a little bit of heaven for me right now. But um, 
using that you you know using his gear, getting that flavor. Um, so that that's what it is. We're at Brett Bryan's house, you know. Oh, cool, cool, and and, and uh, my man Bob, I see, he got my my um man. I'm so mad I got rid of mine. The Joe Meek back there. That, that was uh, a secret weapon. Yeah, it's it's a great it's a great compressor, man. It's the best thing they ever made. Man, that's that was that the little old school secret weapon. A lot of people didn't know about. So yeah, I'm jealous, man. <laughs> and see, I always heard about Joe Meek EQs. I, I did you know the compressor, you um like Bob was saying that the compressor was real good like really I I thought it was just the EQs that were really uh, compressor is the secret weapon the EQs are cool I mean they all got color but the EQ I mean the uh, compressor in the particular that one it's not all of them but that particular right. model there that's that's the one so Bob yeah. actually has a clue about what he's doing by choosing gear. <laughs> I just don't ever, I don't ever get rid of it. Tell them about that, Bob. They don't know. They don't know. <laughs> Got to tell them what's up. <laughs> I, I just don't ever get rid of anything. That's all it is. <laughs> Welcome back, Morris. Just wanted to say hello to you. We have Matthew Weiss, um, Joshua. I don't remember Joshua's last name. We have Ben. I think it's Crames. Am I saying it right, Ben? Ben Crames. And let's see. All right. So Dwayne was hitting him with a barrage of questions. Yeah. Dwayne, go ahead and go ahead and terrorize Bob a little bit more. All right. Uh, uh, so we all have a dream for ourselves and what we want to achieve out of audio. And you probably had one yourself. Could you talk about how you narrowed it down? Was it always this? Was it? No. No. I I went to. When I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to go to a music college. And at that time, I played guitar, drums, bass, piano, and sax. Oh, I'll and get to the I, instruments in a bit. <laughs> I decided to go to Berkeley for bass because they had the fewest bass players. So I figured I'd, I'd have the most gigs at Berkeley if I went for bass rather than just another guitar player because they had a 1,000. So I went there, and uh, I'd already been into recording, recording my own bands and trying to do demos and albums and stuff. And when I got to Berkeley and I saw the bigger studios and uh, I don't know, I just, I kind of leaned towards that direction. So I ended up trying to test out of as much courses as I could. And I did kind of a, a dual major of bass and engineering. And I was in, I was in a college band. We were doing pretty well. Uh, uh, or I, I should say, uh, I was in a, band during college and we were you know touring around New England and stuff and I kind of had to make that decision the last couple of years if I was going to go full tilt with production and engineering or mu stay with music and um, on one hand I kind of felt like being a broke bass player in a rock band wasn't wasn't the way to go maybe I should do the engineering thing and the more I did it the more I loved it you know I, I, I really took advantage of my time at Berkeley, I got a job in the studio office, so I had keys to all the studios. So I was, I was using the studios when I wasn't supposed to, and before classes and late at night. You know, if if no one uh, was using a studio, I'd jump in there and use it and try to record a, a vocalist with six mics and all out of phase and you know just doing weird wacky things just to practice. And I just really started loving recording. And uh, when it when it came time to graduate. I, uh, I was really excited to go to Nashville to learn all about the tracking and learn from those guys. So I, I didn't really fine tune it all the way down to mixing until I got out to LA and realized that, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to do just mix records, you know, so it took a while to focus it down. Is there anything from your education that you apply now? Like what's, what's the greatest benefit of that education to your current situation? The best thing was just the, the multiple hours of experimentation and doing stuff that you don't have time to do out in the real world. You know, once you become an assistant at a studio and then uh, a tracking engineer, overdub engineer, you, you can't really experiment on someone's dollar. So being at school and having all those studios to your disposal um, – if you're in that situation, is it's very valuable to do everything you can think of, and and you utilize as much time as possible, 
uh, before you leave because you won't get that experimentation later on. Yeah. I have to ask, uh, what were your early stuff? What what was that like? What were you? What were the things that you had to um, master? Like, do you remember the order at all? Like how you took a track? Like, did you always mix the same way and just improve the quality, or were you uh, mixing drums first and vocals later? Or no, again, same thing. Experimentation. Like I, I used to. Uh, you know, start with the bass drum and then the snare drum and then the hi hat and just go down the line. And in the end, I couldn't fit the vocal in the mix. And you know, uh, and it just it's just practice, man. It's just hours and hours of doing it. And then thinking about what are you doing wrong and going home, listening to your mixes that you just did, and and you like them that day. And then two weeks later, you hate them because just over those two weeks, you learn something to mix yourself better. And it, it's Everything I do, I, I hate it a year later. It, it, that's just the natural order, and it's always been that way. I don't want to listen to my records that I, I mixed in 2005 or six. I don't want to listen to records I did in 2011, but right now I like what I'm doing in 2014. 2016, I'll probably hate it. So it's just, it's just the natural order for me. It's just improving myself and um, always looking forward, you know. Um, I have one last question before <laughs> I see, see people in the comments there. Um, you said you hate your mixes, so what is the is there a technology that does that? That you're just something brand new comes out and you're like, oh, I gotta use that. Or it, it, it's just style and taste and and I just getting better. It's like my my ability at balancing an EQ and my taste in what sounds good now versus, you know, five years ago. And it could be, it could just be a sign of the times. I could just not like, like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of away from that music from five years ago and, and I like what's going on now. So I can have something to do with it too. But it's, it's on a finite level. Like I like those mixes for the public and for that artist. And, and I'm glad that they got them and were able to use them. Um, but me myself, I I definitely mix different than I did yesterday. You know, I, I have one one. Sorry, this is my real last one. Um, what what are you apologizing? <laughs> I'm sorry. We're loving it. It's the Canadian. Um, what are you listening to now? As are can you name a a track that is the absolute definite best mix ever that everyone needs to listen to to understand? This is the foundation. No, there's not. Ah, I don't, I don't know that. I used to have those. I used to have songs where I thought those are the best mixes, and and so I'm gonna use those as references, and and it'd be stuff like, uh, Will I Am, I'm a B, and uh, that was that was a Dylan Dresdo mix, and uh, Business by Eminem, and uh, I'm sorry, this is my real black one. Um, uh, hey, Mayor, and uh, different. Uh, I don't know anything from Sting to, um, you know, Limp Biscuit. Like there's just there's tons of great mixes out there, and I used to I used to keep them all stockpiled in a folder and reference them. And and now I, I I've kind of gotten away from doing that. Now I just as long as I feel like I have a, a finger on what's current, um, I, I'm I'm comfortable. So I don't really try to model after other songs. I try to always inject my own taste into the music and, and hopefully that's what the artist likes, you know. So I, I think that's if, if you have your own taste as far as the sound, you have your own sonic signature, I, I think it's important to use it because otherwise there it, it makes you more valuable. Otherwise they could hire anybody if you sound like anybody, you know. Good point. That's master class right there. Um, Matthew, I see you have a question. Jump in before I keep going. Uh, I'll be back. All right, Matthew, you're next, and good job, Dwayne. Um, come come back. You can give him a little breather and then come back and, you know, stress him out. I don't know how, how we're going to follow all that up. <laughs> um, okay, so unlike Dwayne, my questions are all greedy and personal, nothing I'm going to ask is going to benefit really anyone besides me. So uh, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong about that. 
So uh, right now, I'm, I'm going to shift things over to a sort of more technical mixed direction, get okay. into it a little bit. Um, I'm working on a record right now, and I am struggling a lot with getting the low end to punch through because it is a rock pop crossover in the realist sense of it where there's a lot of synthetic stuff but then there's also real drums and real um, you know real everything involved as well okay I went through your discography I was already familiar with a good amount of it and you have that thing which I call speaker excursion and probably other people call it that as well but maybe it's just me um, your low end it actually comes out of the speakers the speakers move in that sort of lateral way right. when, when it's turned up and that I get that when I'm lucky, basically. Like, I try a couple things, and I'm like, hey, it worked. But I don't have a systematized way of making that speaker step out, especially once that limiter gets pushed on there at the end. Um, speak speak unto me and deliver knowledge to my ears. Well, first thing with me is no limiter. I, I don't have a limiter at the end. I, I'll have My last thing will be a compressor, specifically an API 2500. It works about 2 to 4 dB, slowest attack, fastest ratio, I mean fastest uh, release. Uh, the ratio is the lowest, the 1.5 to 1. Um, and like I said, it only moves about 2 to 4 dB. And what I do is I just to get the loud mix, instead of using an L L1 which clamps down on your transients, I push API 25's output, I keep turning it up until it's clipping. And then as soon as I hear it crunch, I turn it back down a few tenths of a dB until uh, throughout the whole song there's no distortion. So literally I'm clipping the output of Pro Tools. Which you can hear. And clipping is actually the most natural form of limiting. It's the most transparent. And it sounds scary to a lot of people, but once you do it and you realize that if you can bounce a song and not hear it, it's you'll get great loud mixes, your best low end you've ever had. Um, rather than using those types of uh, Maxim and L1 and L2 that clamp down on your kicks and your snares and, and destroy all the work you spent 12 hours doing. Um, so other than getting away from the master bus, the most important thing is phase. So in a, in a rock pop situation, uh, let's take your song specifically, is it live bass or synth bass or both? It's synth bass and it's also programmed kick. Program kick and synth bass. Yeah. So, is the synth bass is it way down in the or is it kind of more in the mid bass? The synth bass goes down. It goes really very very low. It, the okay. highest I think is maybe at like there's a note at like close to 70 hertz, but it's dipping down to like f under 40 for some little spots, which is another question that we can get into. <laughs> yeah, that, that's I mean that's a big bass. So what you have to decide is I, some people, they'll mix low end and they'll let something win. So they'll either let the kick win and they'll make the bass smaller or they'll let the bass win and the kick will just be all attack, no low end. I like them both to win, so I work really hard at that. And the first thing is checking the phase. Um, and that's if, if you have more than one kick, you got to get the kicks in phase with each other. And if they can't be in phase with each other, delete one and replace it. Uh, if you can get away with it without pissing off the client. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but as far as that bass, you got to either key a compressor to move it out of the way when the kick hits or find like a notch where you can have find a punchy thrust low end to the kick that might be higher, like let's say 90 to 110, and that's where you get that excursion of the, the chest and then let the sub bass go below that to the 40, 50, 60 range, and then maybe have just a little notch of low end for the kick in the upper upper base. And that's really the, the, the idea, is just to make, make it seem like uh, but really they're melded together either by king a compressor or, or like I said, working those frequencies. Um, sometimes it can be a really really big challenge if, if the key of the song is too high and, and the synth bass has all those sub frequencies but the the fundamentals are maybe higher and that's where you wanted the thrust of your kick to be. It, it can be a real problem. 
and and it, that's why low end is the hardest thing in mixing. Um, you also, everyone hates this answer, but your room and your monitoring environment matter so much to be able to work on that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm currently in the best room I've ever had with the best matching speakers to that room. I have, you can see in the background, I have, these are Dave Pensado's Expose KRKs. I don't like them at all, but they make me work so hard on my mixes. My mixes are, are what I think the best they've been in the last four months since he's been, we've been sharing this room for like summer. But, um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it's, if, if your room isn't amazing, it's going to be hard to nail that stuff. And it's a sucky answer because it involves construction and speakers and. Oh, I know. <laughs> I got I got an acoustics guy coming in tomorrow, and just to get him to walk in the door, I have to pay him five hundred dollars. Yeah. So. It's really it's really the worst answer to the the, the most asked question, but it's it, it makes the biggest difference. If you get your room sounding right, you'll suddenly hear those problems easier and be able to pinpoint them. You know, and using there's new tools out like the. Uh, the Fab Filter Pro Q2 with that spectrum analyzer. If you yeah. guys have to check out that EQ, you can do some amazing things and actually see what you're doing. And you can you can do things like send you can send your kick to the side chain of the bass EQ just to see it on the spectrum analyzer while you work on the bass. Like really really crazy stuff like that. So check that EQ out guys. It's that's actually a really powerful thing that I never even knew you're doing. Or, yeah, I have it actually. Uh, uh, I have an endorsement thing with FabFilter, so they wow. they hooked me up, and I love it, and I use it all the time. It's wonderful getting that stuff from software companies that make awesome stuff <laughs> that I would buy anyway. <laughs> I'll tell you another another thing about low end is being careful with filters. A lot of people use high pass filters to contain low end, and sometimes it's better. To actually just do a wide dip at like 30 and 40, like 4 dB, and use a filter because filters increase peak loudness. So you put a filter on a kick that's really close to clipping on your master meter, all of a sudden it'll be clipping, and, and all you did was put a filter on. You'd actually think it would get lower in level, but sometimes it's the exact opposite because you're messing with the phase. And so yeah. like frequencies that were covered by sub frequencies are now poking out. Because you just cleaned up the sub frequency, so be careful using filters too. Sometimes it's just best to use parametric EQ and shelves. And um, another way to clean up synth bass a lot is uh, the Waves Bass Rider. Um, that works wonders on synth bass, just evening out all those notes. Some of those notes, I used to just ride, do bass like draw it in on the on the line graph. The bases can be so uneven at different frequencies. So evening that stuff out with automation or bass rider. Um, another, I'll give you one last technique, which is really nice on synth bases. Do a shelf at like 150 down, 3 dB. You basically thin out the synth base, 3, 4 dB, and then find those rich sub frequencies that you like, just a few of them. Maybe the fundamental, the subharmonic, and maybe one harmonic above that, and just boost little peaks of those musical areas instead of that whole range of 150 down to 20. You know, having that boosted, shove that down, and then just boost a few nice frequencies. And you ever try that uh, that Surfer EQ program? No. Um, it uh, it figures out the the center, the fundamental center of your your bass note. And it will move your EQ as the fundamental changes. Oh, that's so basically, cool. yeah, it's like it cuts down on like some serious automation stuff. But it also has like a harmonic EQ thing where it does exactly that. It calculates all the peaks along where that fundamental would come up the harmonic spectrum and does different variations of little peak boosts. It's cool. It's an interesting little thing. That sounds perfect, actually, for that application. Yeah. Um, all right. Good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up with just two more questions about low end, and then let somebody else do what they need to do. Uh, my my one is a specific one to a record that you did, uh, an Everclear record. Yeah. Um, and it was it, the that record, the drums to me, you know which one I'm talking about, uh, Invisible Stars. Yeah. 
Yeah. The whole drum is a particular song. Is it what? The whole album? Well, in general, the the album, uh, okay. because it all sort of has this continuous thread when I, I've listened to it, which is... <laughs> this is Bill's making fun of me. Um, they sound to me like live drums across the board. Okay. But, but the way they sit in terms of how they punch, tonality-wise, the, the kick in particular, since this is a low-end thing, it sounds like it might have been sample replaced, but it's really hard to tell. So my question is, did you turn an acoustic kick drum into, like, the greatest acoustic kick drum that ever lived, or did you sample replace and blend it really well? Every single drum on that album is has been replaced. Wow. And 80% of the cymbals. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that album, the drum recording on the album was very rough in my opinion and they went through four mixers that weren't into replacing drums they were against it they're they're not sample guys they went through three or four, I think it was three mixers well-known guys that they just whether they don't like to take the time to replace with samples or they're just against it they wouldn't do it and and the drums were really lacking and then I begged to take a shot of that album I'm good friends with the drummer and I did what you heard to the drums and it just knocked them out. So that kind of won me that project, and I got to do the whole album. It but, sounds so re like it sounds so glued together though. Like normally I can tell, like oh yeah, that's a sample replacement. Yeah, well, I took a lot of time to automate and do uh, ghosting samples. Like even the little tiny ghost notes, I placed those things in there. Right. I really killed myself working on that. I was about to say, so the secret to that one was you just spent god long hours making that. Yeah, even, even on the drum rolls where that, that build up, like 16 note drum rolls, I would dull the snare with an automated EQ, and as he hit harder, let the brightness come back. Stuff like that that just really masked it being a sample. And wow. luckily, luckily, Art Alex Zach is the lead singer. He's the leader. He hates toms, so that helps so much on the album. <laughs> A lot of toms. So it was really just kick, snare, and we have an amazing live room here. I got to use a lot of samples that I've, I've done from that on top of uh, that and samples from Henson. You know, I got to use a lot of really cool samples and room sounds on that album. And um, so, yeah, it, but even the crash cymbals on the downbeat, even those are layered with cymbals. It's just kind of remarkable how much fakeness is there, but it. it it works. It doesn't it, sound. It doesn't sound fake. It sounds. It sounds too good to be true. Right. So in that in that I sense, that but cool. <laughs> but I was really not sure. I thought maybe that it was something with some augmentation going on. But wow. Okay. So the answer to that one is blood, sweat, and tears. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, Matt. I mean, um, Bob. Quick question for you. Um, why you said down to the symbols. Why did you um, Why did you choose to use sampled symbols as opposed to calling somebody in to just play them and then mic them up? Um, the reason for that is well, first of all, the reason I had to use symbols uh, because the overheads, for some reason, they didn't cut through, and the louder I pushed the overheads, the worse the drums just became unglued and had this funky kind of room sound. So the samples were the obvious uh, obvious answer to that. But the reason to not have someone play them is to get them sample accurate with the originals. So I would literally zoom in on a symbol from the overheads and place the sample it was right sample accurate with the original. And um, that's I think that's what allows it to work without sounding phasey and gotcha, coming, gotcha. Across, coming across as you know fake. Now, how did you glue them all together in the space? So that they still sound glued in, in one space. Really, it's just kind of with uh, what trick I use is, is I use Alterverb. There's this room called Tonic New York City Room. Uh, ugly, room. ugly room, but it sounds really good. And it glues things together. I use it to glue guitars into a mix. Uh, anything that's just standing out like a sore thumb, you put a little bit of that. And it just it just sinks in. It sounds like it's a piece of the piece of the group. So wow. how cool is that? Yeah, that's that's yeah. great. Yeah. Oh man, very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah, that's. If you guys haven't heard that, check that out. It's pretty interesting. That album. It's called Invisible Stars. It's a 
really weird experience. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever go through that again, but <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely a learning learning experience. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, you know, it, uh, it paid off. It's a really good album. So there you go. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so my very last question would be dealing with the notes that go under the speakers. When you get those notes, and it happens mostly in, in the hip-hop thing where the guys get, like, really overzealous about their 808s and they hit that one note that's, like, 32 hertz or something, and yeah. it doesn't even play back on, like... Like, I've had notes that don't even play back right on my 8-inch speakers, you know, which... That's, like, basically a subwoofer housed in a chassis at this point. Right. And so how do you get those to come back? Um... Well, the the easiest way, the first thing that I do is make sure that they're not too loud. And the way I do that is literally put my hand on the subwoofer. I have, um, you can see in my room, hopefully if the lighting is good enough, I have these really huge Ospergers with 18-inch subs. And <laughs> then I have, I have these little uh, M-Audio subs for the KRKs. I have two of them, one on each side, and I literally put my hand on them, and I, I judge how how much the woofer is exerting compared to the other notes that are easier to hear, and I kind of balance that low, the very low 808s that way. Once I have them balanced, they usually can't hear them, and I, I know that they're safe from blowing up anyone's car or anything, but you can't hear them. <laughs> The only way I've really found to remedy that is decapitator. Put a little bit of distortion on them and then blend the mix back so it doesn't sound distorted and they kind of, you might hear a little bit of it on a laptop speaker, maybe not, but you, you'll sense it a little bit more because it's literally bringing out the upper harmonics. And after that, you just kind of got to, that's really all you can do. Uh, now, if you go with synth bases, um, when I used to work with nephew and I had actually had control of the MIDI, sometimes he would create his his uh, his beats on mains at a big studio like Record Plant, and he'd be hitting all these really low synth bass notes. And I knew like as soon as you get on the NS tens or normal speakers, you're not really going to hear those. So since I had control of the MIDI, I would bump the MIDI up an octave and record a whole other bass pass an octave higher, and I would blend that in just really low to bring out literally an octave higher harmonic and that helps so much on small speakers with the bases that just went way too low. That's right. a great trick if you can get a hold of the MIDI. Um, I've even layered eights that are an octave higher. I have a whole bank of pitched 808s that somebody gave me and sometimes if one's too low, I'll lower the volume of it and put one in that's an octave higher as long as it still sounds cool. And I try to make it so no one knows that I did it. Nice. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna step aside and let somebody else get on the uh, on the conference here. Thank you for for your answers. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, what did you mix on Raymond versus Raymond? Raymond? Uh, I did. Let's see, I did Mars versus Venus. I did Monstar, and then I did Pro Lover, and then about. Two months later, he released another kind of extension of that album called Versus, and on that, I mixed Lingerie, and um, I forget the name of the last song. Uh, it was like Love You Too or something like that. It was like an acoustic baby face kind of ballad. Um, but yeah, I mixed those five between those two albums. Those first three that you rattled off, um, yeah, Wayne actually picked them. Because we were trying to find what songs you mixed on Raymond vs. Raymond, and Dwayne rattled them off uh, over here. Um, real, let's see, real quick. Roger, say hello, bro. What's happening, everybody? Hey, Roger. How's it going, uh, Bob? Uh, Morris, I see Morris on here, and Bob, and the other Bob, and Kalik, and the whole yeah, crew. Yeah, normally we have a bunch of Dave names. Now we got Bob's. <laughs> No Dave Hampton today? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Um, I'm just sitting back soaking it all in. 
All right, and Morris, before we grab uh, Mayor, because Mayor is about to ask a bunch of questions. Well, I don't know if it's a bunch, but Mayor is well, about to Morris, you know, Morris can talk, man. You might have to mute his mic. I, I might have to wait on Morris. You hear that, Morris? I hear him, man. He does that. He does all that rapping. He's got a lot of rap for you. <laughs> all right. Um, and May Mayor, you unmute by taking your cursor up to the top. You'll see a microphone appear. You click on the microphone, and it should uh, unmute you. There oh. you go. You're Works now. Hey. Hey, I'm so technology not uh, related, so you know I'm. That's why I have to. Ask you a sure. <laughs> well, first of all, hi to everybody and hi to Bob. Hey, man. Hi, hi. Hey, do you guys hear me well? We yeah. hear you, Brian. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually. Um, I wanted to touch on the subject that Bob was mentioning about the clipping and the compression and oh, hello we hear you I, um, when people come in I mute them I just muted Jason Torres yeah we still hear you Mayor. yeah you're still here Mayor. we hear you well I thought you were still here Are you there, Mayor? He may have dropped out. Thank yeah, it looks know. like Mayor has dropped out. Real quick, before we get to the next spot, Bob, uh, I was just talking to Bob Brockman. He's working right now, but he said to tell you what's up. Oh, cool. Awesome. Tell him I said hi. And Jason, welcome. Say hello. How are you, gents? Good to see you. Hey, man. Glad to be a part of it. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna run out for two seconds, but I'll be right back. Cool. Alrighty. So All right, can, now uh, another person who's notorious for good questions is Ben. So, um, you ready, Ben? You gotta unmute yourself. You ready? Yep, I'm ready. All right, get him. All right. Uh, thanks, Mark, for having me and uh, Bob. Yeah. So much. <clears throat> I have some uh, uh, vocal mixing questions for you. Sure. Uh, uh, lead vocals, chorus, and background vocals. Um, starting starting with uh, kind of an R&B pop sound. Um, what are some treatments that you do for blending background vocals with lead vocals? So the backgrounds still cut and have their own personality, but the leads still defined and on top. Uh. I think most of that is is achieved with panning, honestly, and just having the lead up the center and having the backgrounds out to the sides, um, and then just fader rides. Uh, I do a lot of fader rides on my vocals to bring out consonants of words, and um, that can help you. Pushing out the consonants of words can help you think the vocals louder than it actually is. Um, but there's there's a lot of tricks I use either. Um, different compression on, like if I if I'm going through a lot of my backgrounds and I have, let's say I'm using 1176 with a fast release, uh, and I'm getting to like the twelfth pair of background vocals, uh, I'll, I'll all of a sudden change it up. I don't use an LA3A with a really slow release, and somehow by switching the way those vocals are are riding with the compression, they'll sit differently and kind of become exposed. Sometimes it's boosting frequencies that, if you listen to the vocal by by itself, you might be like, "Well, why'd you boost 700 hertz? That sounds ugly." But in the mix, it helps it to stand out on its own. So it's it's a mixture of kind of all those things: panning, uh, interesting EQ. I, like at first, I'll go through and make it sound pretty, but then sometimes you'll just find a frequency that helps that background vocal, that twelfth background vocal spoke through, you know, where it wasn't before, and, uh, and of course, like I said, fader rides. If you have, if you have, like, uh, you know, 12, 16 background vocals, how uh, meticulous are you mixing each background vocal, or do you more treat them as groups, or do you... I, I treat each note uh, as a group, so I never combine harmonies into subgroups, so, um, and I'll actually comp vocals when I when I get like a hundred background vocal tracks every note let's say you have the chorus vocals let's say you have four four stacks of 
one note in unison. I'll record that down to a stereo pair, and then the high harmony, record that down to a stereo pair. Even if there's eight tracks of it, it'll get recorded down to stereo. So then instead of 100 faders, I'm looking at like 16 faders. But they're all still individual notes. I don't ever combine like a low and mid harmony onto one recorded track. That way I can EQ them differently. Um, I never really find a benefit to EQ all those different notes together unless unless I hadn't been referencing and my ears were fooling me and I thought the whole background vocal mix was bright but it was actually dark and that I needed to brighten them all as a group. That'd probably be the only time I'd EQ a bunch of vocals together the same way. They usually all get their own individual treatment. And every single vocal, all hundred, will get their own de -esser. Um And that's just because the S's usually don't line up unless unless someone has gone through and used vocal line and cleaned them all up. Um, so I, I, and a lot of times I'll compress individually too. Um, that way, when you have your, your stack of eight vocals left and right, you don't, you're not pushing up the right side or left side by uneven compression. So rather than trying to compress uneven vocals as a stereo pair on a subgroup, compress them individually and they'll become even left to right. You won't get like a, you won't get any bouncing or left to right image problems. So if you have, if you have a four part harmony or three part harmony, instead of having, let's say 12 tracks, you'd have four stereo buses. Exactly. exactly. Four yeah. stereo printed tracks, and yep. then, and then you kind of um, process those to get your final product. Your yeah, product. exactly. Those will receive their own EQ by themselves, and then different amount of reverb. Sometimes I'll I'll use the same reverb for the, all those four parts, but I might use less on the low harmonies than I do on the highs, and that'll keep the reverb from getting washed out and boomy and stuff like that. Uh, recently, I did yeah, I did a, one of my first sessions that had a just ridiculous amount of vocal tracks. So I was having a hard time within the time constraints getting uh, a handle on all the vocals. Um, so I guess my last question is: um, Do when you do when you print the mix, do you kind of dump the entire background or vocal track on a stereo, or do you kind of keep them? No, I keep I, after I do my initial comp to get. You know, a manageable amount of faders. I'll I'll just keep that open. And then will you will you um, bus all the those stereo buses to a final background vocal um, mix? It's actually it's an all vocal subgroup. It includes the leads and ad libs and everything. So, okay, you don't EQ a bus for the backgrounds. They're just EQ differently each harmony. No, nine times out of ten, they'll the EQ will already be how I want it, but. Uh, if I kind of miss something, then I'll, maybe I'll separate the lead in the background onto their own submasters and touch it up there. If like the backgrounds need something that the lead doesn't, but most of the time they just all go together in that final vocal subgroup. I don't really do anything to it. That's awesome. And do you tend to use the same um, space uh, reverb space for a lead in a in a background, or is it one no, one, no, one no. that you make drier? one element that you make wetter? I usually... Backgrounds, I tend to use a mixture of reverbs and delays. Sometimes just delay. Uh, sometimes just reverb, depending if I want... how I want the, the syllables to bounce in the background. If, it, if it's a wordy chorus with the backgrounds, I'll stay away from delays so that the bottom of the mix stays clean. There's no bouncing of quarter note words later on you know, in the mix. Um, but the lead, the lead, I kind of, every song I treat differently, and I, I just kind of, I'll go through eight or ten reverb presets on, like, the Bracasti or something, and find, find what works best for that song, and I and then I do something completely different on the backgrounds. Um, sometimes backgrounds, I'll, I'll end up just using a little bit of a room and nothing else. Sometimes slap the, I, I mix it up all the time. But, the lead in the backgrounds, I could say, just me personally, I never give them the same treatment. Now, last question. If you ever come up with a, a vocal uh, session like that with 100 vocals, backgrounds, it's just out of control. Do you ever do like a sort of an a cappella mix so the vocals just sound amazing with, with without any instrumentation and then creep up the instruments around that? Or do you, do you kind of approach it as a whole blend? 
Actually, uh, I just did this with a Korean pop six songs I did for this Korean pop group. Uh, they're called BTS. Um, that's those sessions were 230 to 260 tracks, uh, lots of music and lots of vocals. And what I would do is I would I would make a quick rough mix of the music, just stereo, and inactivate all the music tracks, just get them out of my sight, and I would just mix it like it's a like a vocal tracking session to a two track. So I just had this kind of rough two track to work off of, of music, and I'd I'd keep it kind of a medium volume, not even balanced correctly, and I'd work on all my vocals, kind of like you're saying, almost like it's an acapella thing, but the music's there, it's just not very loud. And once I got the vocals about 80% dialed in, then I'd open up the music again and, and start to feed that in. Awesome. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely. All right. Kalik's going to have to go in a little bit. Um, Bob, do you know about Kalik's seminars? Uh, I've, I've seen them uh, advertised, but I haven't, I haven't seen one, no. I'm asking because I, I enjoy going to them, and uh, it would be awesome to have you there. I was just going to ask you. I was going to put you on the spot there, Bob. I don't know what your oh. schedule's like, but, man, I would love um, if, if you would be open to having a discussion about possibly doing some kind of um, – no presentation that would help everybody. It could either because this time I'm trying to do it live stream as well as in the as well as there at the spot, and um, we can make it real easy on you. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to. You, you know what? Um, um, I don't have your contact information, but um, I'm gonna put my um, I'm gonna put my email in the uh, chat box here on the side. Okay, I'll take it down. Okay, and. Uh, so everybody who listens to the guys complain that back in the day they were able to have community and meet in the lunch room or go from Studio A to Studio B, this right here helps. You now see two engineers exchanging phone numbers. Look at that. See? This is how you do it. Yep, yep, absolutely. And, um, man, I, yeah, I would love it. We definitely should touch. So, so I put it in the side. Just copy and paste it and shoot me an email, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then let's talk over the phone. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you say you're sharing the spot with uh, Dave? Yeah, uh, from April to probably probably the top of December, uh, Dave and I are kind of running two shifts in my room. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and then he's he's we might build him a spot. We're we're in talks about that now. We might expand next door and build some more rooms, but if not. He's kind of looking around town at different places that he might go. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Well, yeah, definitely. She may back and come by and just hang out with you one day or something. Where are you at yeah. in Burbank? Come on, uh, it's North Hollywood. Oh, you're in North Hollywood. Well, okay, cool. We're very good. Yeah, that's yeah. actually where I'm gonna have. Um, I'm gonna have the uh, event too. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, come on through anytime, man. Yeah, man, definitely, definitely. Okay, well, let's talk further, man. Definitely. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, I got to take off and get back to it, but it was a pleasure meeting you, man, and um, I look forward to talking to you, buddy. All right, man. Have a good one. Take care, everybody. Y'all have a great day. Bye, Peace out, Khalid. Right. And Jason had a question for you. Are you ready for him, Jason? I am. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Um, Bob, I was wondering how you deal with um, sibling vocalist. I've got a vocalist that I, uh, I deal with. And first off, I'm sorry, let me just address everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to be a part of this. Um, there are amazing heavy hitters in the room and regularly in the room, and I appreciate everything that they do for us. And Sadia has been amazing for me. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Great, great. Um, Bob, uh, I was wondering how you deal with sibling singers. I deal with a sibling singer regularly. Um, we have kind of a, a long-term working relationship. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the mic that we deal with is an 87 clone, which is great, but it's a bit peaky for him. And uh, he's a little sibling in the room. He's a great vocalist, does amazing work. Um, I, um, I've tried DSing. I've tried dipping with automation, um, some EQ, um, and just basic editing. And none of it really gives me a result that I'm happy with. You know, it all comes off sounding lispy or clipped. And um, just wondering what tips you might have. Um, S's, it's, it's, the funny thing about S's is they're not one frequency 
which DSing plugins would allow us to think they are. Um, S's can be, they'll be made up of, of 2K, 5K, and 10K all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the, a lot of times, if, if you look at my vocal chain in Pro Tools, it's, it's ridiculous. It's usually 10 plugins, 8 to 10 plugins. Um, right. And that includes compression, EQ, the C6 multibands, and usually one or two DSers. Um, I usually find different DSers that work good on different ranges. So if if I'm hearing that the S's are strong in like the 3K range, I'll use the the standard Waves DSer, not the Renaissance, but the the gray one. Mm. And then for S's that are like real high, like 9, 10K and above. I really like the Massey DSer, and um, if I really gotta kind of hit it the whole range all at once, the the uh, Fab Filter Pro DS is is a great DSer. That's what I'm using right now, and I really like it. Yeah, some work better than others. Um, sometimes I'll find one that's not really working, and and uh, switch it out for a different one that'll work better. A lot of times, the problem that people have with DSing is they start to pull down that threshold and the vocal gets dark and they get afraid because now they're they're ruining their vocal sound so they back it off right. and then they're no longer DSing. And in order to DS properly, you're going to have to affect your vocal in a negative way. So I usually try to just be brave, pull that DSer down, make it work really hard, and then I use an EQ to bring the level back up. And it that does bring the S's back up a little bit, but mm -hmm. now they're controlled. And sometimes I'll have to get in there with the C6 multiband on top of some of the other additional frequencies and, and work on those as well. I've resorted to things like clip gain, going through every S and clip gaining the S down. Sometimes I'll just do it with volume automation. Right, I've got two. Sometimes I'll do all that, and it does sound a little lispy, and the artist will come in, and, and they'll notice it the most because they're the singer, and they'll tell me to back it off a little bit. And usually by that time, I, I was so honed in on the S's, I was getting paranoid. So when I finally back it off a little bit, and I realized it's actually not as bad as it was. Um, you're mentioning that the mic is probably an issue. I used to find that be the problem with the uh, the old Sony C800. Certain singers cannot get rid of their S's on that mic. It's just it's just an unfortunate match. And uh, the best thing you can do is switch out the mic, which sometimes for budget reasons or um, – you know, if that's all the studio has or all you own, you don't have that choice. But um, obviously, that's that's the first fundamental thing to try to do is find a, a better matching mic that maybe isn't so essy for them. But uh, all the all that. <laughs> yeah, all I, I I hear you, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. How how well does tape and saturation? How well do they help with that? Before Bob answers, I have just recently started using a, a tape saturation plugin, and it really did help me tremendously, and I, I was really uh, impressed by it. You, you know what? What works really well, and what you guys with what you guys are talking about is the Phoenix uh, plugin on mm -hmm. the setting dark essence. Uh, that actually kind of does a natural de-essing that awesome. is really, cool. which to make the S's sound pleasant rather than try to get rid of them is to use an audio suite EQ really steep sharp peak at 2.5k which is a really piercy ugly frequency and I'm talking 10 dB dip but really sharp and I'll go through an, an audio suite the S's and, uh, and then go and crossfade them and then at that point the S's actually sound pleasant even though they're still loud and then you can just use a little bit of the or plug in and fine tune them so sometimes it's just the fact that the S's are harsh, not the fact that they're there. Right. So you can EQ just those S's with an audio suite plug. That can go a long way as well. Do you, do you tend to edit them back at all? Like uh, maybe um, cut them back in length a little or, or anything like that? Uh, no. No, I usually either do all the, the aforementioned stuff or, or the audio suite thing. I, um, yeah, I never really shorten them unless there was some kind of accident in the recording where they held something unnaturally too long, you know? Cool. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Yeah, that audio suite, 
uh, use an audio suite works. Let's just say awesome. The the I was watching a tutorial one time and a guy said put the S's on a separate track. Blew my mind when <laughs> it went in and and did that. Um, people don't realize some of the work, the actual work that goes into some of this stuff. The um what what do they call it? Call us when we like people who are willing to put that type of attention to detail. There's aim though the word anal and there's something else. Um, right. <laughs> as you were sitting there saying saying that That's dipping it like 10, 10 dB, Charles was back there going like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they call it maniacs. Maniacs. All right, you said um, Michael Jackson. Um, yeah. Tell me about working with Michael Jackson. And and the reason I'm asking is because when I deal with artists, um, the the amount of work that you have described that you would put into a track, say an artist leaves, say they Sam dealing with a rapper, they come in, they spend 30 minutes, spit their verse, they leave, and then I spend five hours. Um, tell me about Michael Jackson, his work ethic, whatever, or what he expects of you, like the level, whatever. Just speak on that for me. So I want the people that I deal with to hear this. Uh, Michael Jackson, you, you pretty much just have to be – invisible like like when he wants the pro tools or the tape machine to play it, it needs to be playing when he wants a volume turned or more reverb it it has to happen almost before he finishes the sentence so it it's it's just a high level of awareness and watching out for any possible thing that he or or the producer ask for at that session where if I'm working with my own artist, I might be more relaxed and they ask for reverb and I'm like, yeah, okay, one second. And I take my time and give them a little reverb with Michael. You just, you gotta be on it. You gotta have three delays set up and muted. So if he asks for a delay, all you gotta do is hit that one button. Um, it, it's just a matter of being, making him feel like there's no engineer in the way of him recording. So there's nothing technical that's going to, keep him from getting his idea out as fast as he wants to at the moment that he wants to do it. Um, when we went to Miami, we walked in and we had a big live room. There was a grand piano. There was an acoustic guitar just owned by the studio off on a stand. And I mic'd up the piano. I put a mic out for the acoustic guitar and I put up a vocal mic and I went ahead and looked. I didn't put up the drum mics, but I went ahead and looked at all the drum mics just in case Michael were to ask, you know, hey, can we, you know, get a drummer down here and, and mic up a drum set? I would already know what they had in the closet. But sure enough, he goes over to the piano and wants to record it. I already had a preamp level for the piano. I already had a sound that sounded good. I already had it routed to two tracks and Pro Tools. And I already had a track created called Piano. That was a blank track. So I had, all I had to do was arm it, and as soon as he started playing the first note, we were in red recording. And that kind of stuff, not only will it, it get you called back again, but it it just, at the end of the day, when they leave that session, they think they, they feel like, wow, that went really smoothly. And, uh, you know, that it helps them be the most creative they can be at all times. So that's what it's like with Michael Jackson, that and a lot of waiting for him to show up. <laughs> what about um, his skill level at what he does, professionalism? How how good is he? Like doing takes, you know, how proficient, all that. Michael's great. He, he's uh, I mean, every take to to me always sounded like wow, that could be a finished record take, and and he was. It's kind of like how I perceive my mixing, like like someone that likes my mixes might think, oh, that's a great mix, and I might hear ten things wrong with it. With Michael, he hears ten things wrong with his performance he just did, but all of us in the control room were like our jaws are on the floor, like wow, that's that's an amazing vocal take he just did. So it's it's kind of you kind of just keep recording till he feels like he's done, and then you guys have an editing session, a comping session where he picks the best of what he did, and it all kind of sounds good. <laughs> just it's without him there you would probably pick the wrong things because it all sounds good to us. So, and What about his attention to detail? It's it's a lot. It's ridiculous. 
He's never satisfied, mostly when the tracks. He can get vocals done and be happy with his vocals, but with tracks, he'll switch out a snare, then two months later, switch out the snare again, and then the next day, switch it out three more times. And it's just, he takes a long time to get stuff done, and he, he keeps going over stuff again and again and trying new things. And then eventually he just won't ask you to bring a song up anymore. And then you'll realize, oh, maybe we're not ever going to touch that song again. So it's it's pretty interesting with him. He's he's very every sound. He'll he'll go out and have you mic the lid of the piano for him to slap on with his hands or play a spoon on top of the doorknob and mic that. And he'll put that through the whole track really low. So he's really a, a creative guy and really does some weird, intricate things that you wouldn't expect. Really. Yeah. All right. So, so my crew, when I keep when I when I tell you about this stuff, you've now heard it from Bob Horn. You all must submit now. It's a little inside joke with my crew. All right. Um, let's see. Charles, he has one for you. Good, Bob. What's going on, man? Hey, how you doing? How's it going, everybody? Good. Pretty good. Now, bro. My, my question. We're talking about Michael Jackson, right? And I wanted to. Uh, kind of uh, get more into you. I want to get more into how you felt when you came into that situation, meaning that um, were you sweating bullets, number one, because you didn't know what you were working on? Did you know what you were working on? Uh, what project you were working on? What song? Before you even met him? I, I knew the, the instrumental tracks because I was working with one specific <laughs> producer uh, named Nephew. And uh, I had I had I had bounced the tracks and recorded them from the MPC and the keyboards and even played some guitars and bass on them and uh, we did about 20 tracks before we went to Miami to meet Michael and we kind of presented those 20 for him to pick through and ended up using none of them and creating from scratch when we got there. So uh, on one hand, I felt like I was prepared, but then right there when we got there, all of a sudden. We're doing something new, so we broke out the instruments again, the NPCs, set it all up, and started making new tracks. And I, I don't know if that was just because he wanted to make sure we made something new and fresh, and it wasn't a year old, even though we just spent the last two weeks making tracks. I don't know why he he didn't really even listen to the twenty that we already made. He just wanted us all to create together in Miami, and um, yeah, I, I've I've always felt. I haven't been in too many situations where I was unprepared and nervous in that regard. Sometimes it's just when they throw that wrench in, in the system and you got to recover really quickly, you know, like they want something and you're not, you don't have it or the studio doesn't have it. Those are the times where it gets a little hairy and uh, you got to figure it out. But I, I've always tried to, to be prepared as much as I could before the artist walks in. Uh, I don't think I've ever screwed that up too badly. <laughs> nice. Okay. Which Michael Jackson project was that? What's that? Which Michael Jackson project was that? It's the one that would have come out if he didn't pass away. So it was. Uh, it would have been his, his album after Invincible that never came out. Okay. Go ahead, Charles. No, you actually asked. You answered my question. You asked. You asked the question that I was gonna. And then my next question, Timbaland. Uh, what was the set? Uh, what was the uh, the project that you did with uh, Timbaland? Oh, uh, Shock Value One. I mixed. Oh, nice. Nice. I mixed uh, uh, song number nine, Fantasy. Uh, I mixed a couple of things for that, but that was the only one that made the record. Um, was it Marcella? Uh, Marcella Aracia mixed the rest of that album, but. Uh, the producer asked me to that I was working for at asked me specifically to mix that one. So yeah, that's a great album. Okay, so with that parallel to that with the mix, Chucky, Chucky, please, thank you. Sorry. With that mix, right? Uh, of course shock value one, right? So you have the, the mix that you did on the album. Oh right? uh, shock value Shock Value One, right? Yeah. Okay. And then you have, um, and then you you said that uh, our mixer came in and did you know some other, another project, a couple projects for the album. So when it comes down to 
big thing, I guess, I guess it's a mastering thing. So when you come down to mastering, right, did it, do you feel like it flowed, the mix flowed into the next, the next uh, mixer, the next engineer, the next, you know what I'm saying, the next, you know what I mean? Yeah, I actually really, I really didn't feel like it did. I felt like either, either she should have mixed that song or I should have mixed a bunch more. Um, because it, it was so different because I didn't get to hear any of the album and neither did the producer that did that one song. Timbaland was the overall producer, but this track was made uh, by a guy named Walter Millsap and Walter and I, we didn't get to hear the rest of the album, which had its own kind of unique sound. And, uh, yeah, so I kind of feel like they, they had to do a pretty extreme mastering on my mix, which made it pretty different from my original mix. But, uh, I, I guess in the end it kind of fit on the record, but um. Uh oh, Charles uh disappeared on us. Charles, if you can hear me, um, we don't hear you. We you you frozen up. The the sounding different for me when I listen to a, an album and my I get tired of the same sound so. When I hear a, a sound that comes on totally different, it's refreshing to me. Yeah, you know, maybe, huh? yeah. <laughs> maybe it's okay then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I end up liking that, and and you know I hear mastering engineers, you know, where they're saying that they want everything to sound like it belongs on the same. It makes me not even. It's it's like well, I'd rather master my own project, and they can complain about whatever, but I want the different changes. Like when I change a radio station. I'm hearing I, I change the radio station and get a whole different experience. Right. So your mix on that album being different, bro. That me, I welcome it. No. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> okay, who? Let's see. Max Deering finally came in. He finally made it. He's been trying to come in for a while. Mayor is still trying to come in. Uh, Max, you got a question for him or say hello real quick. Uh, hey everybody, how y'all doing? Hey, how's it going? Oh, uh, it goes good. Um. I, I probably am going to be backtracking uh, over something that everybody else has already asked. Um, uh, I usually uh, track vocals, or I'm finding that I'm tracking a lot of vocals. Uh, U47 fed into 1073 and using the purple uh, MC77. Um, as far as uh, trying to tame things down. Uh, any recommendations uh, or uh, any any quote unquote formulas that you use uh, to subtly compress, or do you go ahead and look for a final compression uh, as you're tracking? Well, when I when I track, there's there's two compressors that if I have access to, I'll do a compression. One is the retro stay level. Uh, because I can do 10 dB of compression and not hear it, uh, and if it sounds right, I'll I'll go for it. The other one is the Daking FET compressor. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's these um, green compressors with silver knobs. Um, those things you can compress a vocal as much as you want, and uh, and you don't hear it. It actually just ends up being an automatic vocal ride. It's a really awesome compressor. It's very transparent. But if I don't have those, then I usually go the other way, and I try to be very, uh, very relaxed with my compression. Maybe not do more than one or two dB, because uh, if you have something like an LA2A or an 1176, you're stuck with that sound. Especially an 1176 is so aggressive. I love it on the mix side, but that's because I can adjust it up to the very end. If I do it on the tracking side, um, you're stuck. And I remember one time I was recording rap vocals and those guys they get amped up in the booth and and when you check the level when you have them check the level it's one volume and then they get excited and their drilling goes and it's it's like another few db and all of a sudden you, it's kind of grainy and aggressive and and maybe not in a good way and you're stuck with it so if i don't have a couple of those really transparent compressors i'll, I'll be i'll be i'll try to do stuff on the monitor side or in pro tools okay Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Why is it that more engineers don't promote those compressors? Um, I, we keep hearing LA2A, 1176. Why is it more engineers don't promote those compressors? I do it on the tracking side. Um, 
you're stuck. I remember one time I was recording. They are. You gotta um, turn your. Those guys they get amped up in the booth. You gotta turn, turn your uh, YouTube off. When you have them check the level of Spotify, and then they get excited. And, and I have to mute Mayor. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Uh, so say again. Why don't they advertise what or promote what? People constantly promote like LA two A's eleven seventy sixes. You're sitting there telling us about these transparent compressors. Why is it that people don't promote the ones that you just said? Why do they keep promoting these old LA two A's and? I think mostly because it's all they're familiar with. Whether uh, if they're a young person and they've they've watched a lot of Pensado's plays and a lot of YouTube and and they've gone to the studio websites like the big studios, Record Plant and Conway, and that that's all those studios have. Those the bigger the studio, the more traditional gear they have and the less new stuff they have. Like you're not going to see a lot of the new cool hip 500 series stuff at Record Plant. It's going to be all the old classics, LA-3A, LA-2A, Pultex. So a lot of people get familiarized with that stuff, and they like it. They think it's the best stuff on the planet, which it, it, it is great stuff. And uh, some people just aren't into searching out all new gear. Like, I, I'm i a gear nut. I, wanna, I give everything a chance. I try everything that I have time to try if it comes through. Um I get, I get a lot of people that drop stuff off for me to check out and give my opinion on uh, before they go try to market it, you know, sales guys and stuff. And um, So, like, the Dakin compressors, some guy, some engineer I assisted back in the 90s uh, had those in Nashville, and I, I watched him use them, and I just really loved them, so I made sure when I could afford it, I bought a pair. And I rarely ever see them. I think I've seen them only a handful of times. Um, and I think Jeffrey Daking is now a little more popular that he released his 500 series stuff, but um, it's not like I knew him in Nashville. In Nashville, all the cartridge and rental companies were really pushing the Jeffrey Daking compressors. And in the retro stay levels, those have only been out a few few years. They're recreations of the old stay level. Some guys know them if they were in a, a famous studio they worked for. Um, a lot of guys don't know them. They're, they're expensive pieces, and they're not in a lot of studios. And um, So a lot of people, they only know it if they have a friend that has one or they took the risk to buy it without hearing it. And uh, I happened to help build a studio and had the, the person buy two of them, and I got to play with them, and that's, that's how I discovered them. So um, a lot of people just don't know about all the gear and what it can do. How how good are the 500 series um, tools? Because that's really taken off. Uh, most of them are, are excellent. It's the thing about 500 series is is the power supply able to supply enough voltage to what the unit is doing, and that's why some units you'll see the double wide, like the SSL 500 series compressor, actually takes up two slots because it needs it needs extra power, extra voltage. So that's the only thing that's ever in question. Other than that, you can get any piece of gear. Even They're even putting tube gear in 500 series stuff now. Um, we just had uh, Cliff Mog bring by a new compressor he's making. Um, you guys might be familiar with the Mog EQ4 or, or Pre-Q4s. That stuff's great. He just came out with a new compressor. There's so many pieces for that series because it's so cheap to make. They they don't have to make power supplies. You buy a box that supplies 10 of them. Um, so they can offer all that gear for 700 to 1200 bucks rather than rack mount pieces that are 3000 So that's kind of why the 500 stuff has exploded. Um, now almost every company is making 500 series things, and they're, they're great. They're awesome. The um, would, you, would you run off... Um a couple of the tools that you know that are newer, that are pretty awesome, that are just pretty damn good, like the Deking or whatever. Yeah, the uh, the Deking stuff is great. The um, the inward connections stuff is is awesome. They make a compressor called the Brute. It's a solid state version of their old back rack. Uh, that thing is really awesome. Uh, my partner Eric has those in his room. The um, the 1073 LBs, the, it's just the preamp from the 1073. 
a lot of people were skeptical of those because they're the 500 series format. They think it's cheaper. It's not as good. They're awesome. Really good. The Rupert Neve stuff is good. He's got a, a preamp with this feature called Silk, which adds harmonics to the signal. Makes makes for some really cool sounds when you're recording. Um, there's a company called Classic API. Uh, it's a guy that supplies parts to make basically make your own uh, API preamps. So if, if you're into soldering and that kind of stuff, you can basically get a vintage API preamp for like 100, 200 bucks. I have a couple. I'll show you guys. Uh, where's my picture? These right here. These are VP26 API preamps. And uh, they sound awesome. They're really wonderful. They have red dot op amps. And the cool thing is they have an output knob. So you can drive the preamp harder and get it kind of distorted and then lower the gain. So if you put that on snare or toms or something, you can get some really cool sounds out of it. And like I said, if you're willing to solder those together, they're only 200 bucks. So pretty awesome. Besides snare and tom, what else would you distort like that? Maybe a bass guitar, maybe a, a second channel bass guitar. I always like to keep one clean. Um, maybe kick drum, you know. It depends how creative and adventurous you want to be. When I heard that I could do that, I thought that uh, people were doing that with vocals, and so I started distorting vocals, <laughs> lead, lead vocals, and I was like, hold on, that's not, this is what pro is? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. You can do um, lead vocal, just don't do it on the recording. Yeah, I was doing it on the recording. <laughs> <laughs> Screwing up. Um, okay, uh, Max had another question for you, follow-up. Yeah, uh, speaking of compressors and the, and the like, uh, what are some of the, uh, the sleeper products that, um, not necessarily cheap, but uh, just really excellent bang for the buck that nobody really thinks about? Um, I mean, other than what you've already mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think the Inward Connections Vac Rack is one of the most amazing vocal compressors. Very expensive. Very. You got one? Yep. There you go. That's it. The um, for a lot of Pensadians guys that may might only be in the box, the Distressor, which I see you have a couple. Yeah. A lot of guys. They hear about the distressor and they they just have never gotten to use one, or they think they're covered with their plugins. And if you realize there's not a distressor plugin out that's officially endorsed by uh, by Mr. Durr, and that's because he's still selling so many of the hardware units, he can't he can't make the plugin. He'll start to lose money. Yeah. So I should tell you something. If if you got twelve hundred bucks for a hardware compressor, buy a distressor because they're special. Oh, I love them. I absolutely love them. I, uh, you know, I didn't know if there was, uh, you know, like uh, w one of my sleepers is the DL two forty one. There's a lot, you know. I love my one sixties, but uh, the two forty one, you know, on you know, when I'm looking, hmm? yeah, yeah, the drummer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause you know, I, I've been seeing those go for a hundred and twenty five, a hundred and thirty bucks, and you know, uh, one sixty XTs are going for two seventy five, three hundred bucks occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, the um, the Shadow Hills 500 series stuff is great too. Like the the Vandergraaf and the Optograph, really a lot of character that you can impart on a sound. Um, especially the Optograph, it's just got a really cool grab to it that you don't get with uh, a lot of the other compressors. Um, oh, you know, a big sleeper is the. Uh, the Overstayer FET compressor. That's over O V E R Stayer S T A Y E R. Um, I have two of these things. They're stereo compressors, and there's nothing in the world that sounds like them. They're my absolute favorite drum bus compressor. Um, I think Ross Hogarth uses it on his two bus, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. Maybe maybe Joe Easy. Um. It's a little aggressive for my two bus. I like a cleaner two bus, but man, for 
piano and uh, um, some of the other uh, drum bus. I'll see if I can, if you guys can see them. Trying to look at my window here. They're above my uh, my keyboard. There's they're half rack spaces, um, little guys, but they're they're just amazing compressors, and seven hundred bucks. So not expensive at all. And, and as soon as I got my first one, I had to buy a second one. I, th I thought they were that great. Ross Hogarth to be on here. This coming Saturday, you should come in a uh, surprising. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the uh, Brian has a Drummer MX30, and um, he would he was I was like you sh I was like bro I don't know this one, and he just put it in on a vocal, and it was like nine dB, and yet it sounded good. Huh? I was like damn, okay. And then I've seen distressers get up to like sixteen dB of reduction. And yeah. you'll hear people say just barely touch, but I'm I'm looking at 16 dB and I'm hearing a vocal. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. You know. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Mayor. Yeah, wait, Max, were you done? Max, were you done? Yep, Charles, you wanted to say I'm something. Done. It looked like Charles. Hey, Max, sorry about that, Max. Yeah, I was gonna say, what's that red, uh, the red uh, uh, rack behind you? What's that one? Uh, are you talking about that you can currently see in the picture? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's for uh, it's for Mott. It's for Mott. Mott. Oh, me? In the back of you. Red rack. Oh, over T there? This? A TCO2. This? A TCO2. Okay. A TCO2. Nice. Um, optical oh, compressor. I've never nice. touched it. No clue. Um. I just know that I like this art and that MX right there. Those are the only things I've tried. And this 11 rack. I Ryan gets in there and jams on the guitar with this 11 rack, and, bro, I just, I'm loving it. So, nice. Um, we're going to get to Mayor, but hold on. Uh, um, Morris had something for you. You there, Morris? Yes, sir. What's up, man? Hey, hey. You What's up, everybody? Hope everybody's doing good except for Roger. Um, so it's like that's my brother, so I have to always get out on him. Bob, how you doing, man? Good. How you doing? Good. Great, man. Um, um, you you have a lot of impressive stuff. I have one question I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. your your time in Nashville. Um, did you um did you do a whole lot of assisting in Nashville, like assisting on live sessions and stuff like that? Yeah, that's that's almost all I did. I I just kind of started to engineer and get overdub gigs as I left so I was mostly an assistant when I was in Nashville okay did you ever did you ever work with like some people like Randy Poole? um I don't think I ever worked with Randy I he, I always saw him because I, I worked in a lot of the studios around town and I would see his racks and his name on his racks and I, I think I met I might have met him once. I don't, okay. really, I don't think I ever assisted him personally. Okay, okay. Um, one question I did want to ask you, though. Um, uh, you know, they were talking about the low end, but my question is more targeted towards the marriage of that low end and that, that low mid, that mid-range area, uh -huh. um, especially as it pertains to um, doing stuff when you're dealing with pianos and, like, roads and the bass and that place to where you get that Cause you know the low end is not really hard for me, and you know the top end is cool. But the area that I think I, I have the biggest area of like concern is to try to get right is that mid range, and then when that mid range is melding it, just gelling it together with that low end, you know that part that it's like this one little spot, you know, and I may be around from that that 200 or 155 to about 400 hertz, where it's like. Sure. You know what I mean? That wolfy thing can be there, and it's just like a lot of times, um, especially a lot of stuff I, I end up doing will have roads, and it'll have piano in it, and yeah. you know other stuff that's kind of in that family. So I wanted to get your thought process on a lot of the, any of that kind of stuff. Well, especially roads and piano, that's that's where their warmth is in that area. Um, so it can be very tricky because you don't want to carve that area out. A lot of engineers, they, they just want to clean up that area all over their mix, and then they have mm -hmm. this 
kind of scooped out, thin sounding mix, even if it right. has this sub frequency. So it I kinda I kinda look at all the instruments and decide what's important. So if I'm mixing an R and B song and the Rhodes is my main keyboard, I'll try to leave some of that area in there and, and I'll I'll investigate it. I'll I'll get an EQ down there and start sweeping around and seeing if there's any mud that can be tightened. Sometimes uh-huh and pull out a little 300 and boost a little 200 instead and it'll it'll sound better and and a little more open mm-hmm. but what I'll do is I'll I'll look at what else is in there guitars if there's a guitar that's real extra full and I got my Rhodes as my main instrument the guitar is just kind of a secondary thing maybe that guitar doesn't need to be as full so if you end up having one full instrument in a song like that and then Maybe the piano's really tight in that area. You kind of put out a little 250 mm-hmm. and made it brighter. That's kind of how I approach it. I, I kind of, instead of having five, six instruments all with that fullness, I, I kind mm-hmm. of try to pick one important thing that can live in that range. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes synth pads are really nice, real warm synth pads. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll end up thinning out other stuff just to leave that room. When, when you get three, four instruments building up in that area it gets real real ugly mm-hmm. so sometimes want- you, can, you can also send those those instruments that contain a lot of that area send them all to one submaster so send like your roads your grand piano and some synth pads submaster and and get a multi-band compressor that kind of rides that 150 to 400 range and just clamp down on that a little bit that way you're not queuing it out you're just kind of you're tightening a little bit with some compression. Oh, that's great, man. Good thing. One last question. So behind you, I'm looking at King. Is um is that a Neve piece under there? Is that like one of those pure path? No, you're close what? though. It's a Rupert Neve strip from his ninety ninety eight console. Okay. Which, it look it looks like one of the pure paths, the ones he used yeah. to do back those it old. It came out four years before the pure path came out. Oh, so it was before, prior to. Yeah, so okay. it, it's the same idea. That's that's what he what he based the pure path stuff off of, but okay. it's called ninety ninety eight pre EQ. Okay, I was wondering. Boosie loves those. He has some of them, and I look. I say, it looks like he got one of those uh, little secret need pieces, those pure paths around here. It's great, Real cool, for, man. Really great, good. Great, great. Yes, sir. Thank you. Does that mean you're done, Morris? Yeah, I'm cool, man. I'm pushing back. I, I had those specific questions, you know. Plus, I didn't want to give Roger too much of a headache. <laughs> you got any questions for him, Roger? I got to get to a mayor here, but okay. So, mayor has some questions for you. Um, back when we were talking about low end, the question about low end, mayor wanted to chime in, and he got kicked out. Um, he got booted out accidentally. Um, his internet messed up on him. Go ahead, mayor. Is it? Is it still uh, doing problems, or you can hear me now? We hear you fine, bro. We see you and hear you. Good, good. Okay, well, uh, first of all, hi to everybody, and hi to Bob. Hello. Hey. Um, I mentioned in the chat that Bob is, is one of the masters in low end, because, uh, you know, so he's really good at that, and I, as a mastering engineer, can say that by working with him, uh, that it always his low end is really good, and... Um, so what I wanted to ask, uh, well, first of all, you, you had mentioned about the API, and I was just wanting to elaborate on that. We're talking about a, about a plug-in API, right? Because right? uh, yeah. I'm asked here if it's in Pro Tools, and um, one of the things I did want to mention about the API is the reason that punch comes in, it's because that c- compressor has a kind of an effect of raising up inner information. It's like pumping it up without the actual pump feel. So when you're when you're uh, using the compressor and you're clipping it, are you clipping the output of Pro Tools to it as like um, as like your send is clipping it or are you clipping itself at the compression stage? I'm clipping it. It's the it's the last it's the very last thing. It's the it's the gain makeup that I'm pushing up, and it's the last thing in my chain. So I'm pushing, and I, it's uh, it's feedback, not feed forward. 
Yeah, that was the next question. Okay, so yeah. back I'm more. pushing. I'm pushing up the gain makeup, and it basically is just bringing up the entire Pro Tools master level until it hits that ceiling, and then I just start listening for it to get get crunchy. Uh, and then if I do, that's when I back it down. Okay, so when you say it's so you say it's feed, feedback mode, then you're compressing it. The more you level it up, the more you're compressing it with the, with that gain up. Not in the plugin. I actually tried it both ways, and the the makeup gain is purely on the outside. It doesn't act the same way as the hardware. Oh, okay. Because that's what I wanted to know. Because I I use I have a modified version of it. Right. And when I do the fold the feedback mode, the more I push the gain, the more it clamps it down because it feeds this, the um, amplified signal back. Yeah, the the plugin. The it's plugin doesn't work with uh, the output gain makeup, and actually that that works for me Crunchy because you know, when I turn my mixes in for mastering, I turn down that output gain about eight dB from where I had it when it was clipping. Uh, that way, I can send it to you guys for mastering, and you don't get upset. <laughs> so when you sent to me, so when we worked uh, on the last project, you yeah. took, you kept the API on, but you lowered down the gain. Yeah, and the gain reduction is the same on the compressor. It doesn't move. I'm strictly not clipping anymore, and then I'll let you do that. So that's the only difference is uh, the compressor is actually working the same strength. It's just the output is uh, – I guess it's – yeah, it's not interactive like the hardware unit. It's, it's literally just an output from the plug-in. I see. Okay, and now are you printing to a new track or you're bouncing? Bouncing. So how do you know your? How do you monitor your levels? Like, if if you're bouncing, how do you know that the print level? Uh, I just look at the the um, the meters on the master fader. I have a Duro meter plugin that I use, um, mm -hmm. and the however I have the playback alignment on my Apogees, mm -hmm. it's matched. So where if it distorts audibly with the session open then it distorts on the bounce, too. I know some people have that misalignment where it won't be distorting in their session, but then when they listen back to their bounced wave file, it's distorting. Mine is, seems to be matched perfectly, so if I hear distortion, it's distorted. And if I don't hear distortion, I'm, I'm good. So your monitoring DA basically is aligned. Yeah, to exactly. So, okay, so like, uh, so if you'll, you'll align it, let's say, minus 14... A, in a like with an oscillator and a metering, it will actually come out at your apogee uh, metering the same as exactly. Yep. Okay. I just say okay. So that 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 was interesting for me because, like I said, my hardware works the app different, and, and like you sure. said, you tested it and it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. It, Waves probably didn't do that on the plugin because they probably thought it would confuse people. So. I see. Okay. Yeah. And and um, in general, I, I know that when I got the mixes from you, you know they were really good and leveled. And they were not clipping or anything. But is there when you send to your clients, uh, what's the ratio of pure mix versus leveled up mixes? What What do you mean ratio? Like ratio, like how many of your clients, let's say the professional involved, let's say producer right. or artist, how many of them would like to hear a pure mix, let's call it unclipped or unleveled, none in compare none of them. None of them. They all wow. want, I mean, I, I've had one person ask for a lowered mix this year and no one else in five years. They, If it doesn't sound as loud as everything else in their iTunes, they can't judge it properly um, and they think something's wrong. So that's why I've worked really hard the last couple of years at, at getting my mixes loud without distortion because if it's not if it if it's not even close, if it's not at least close, they feel like something's wrong with the mix and then they ask me to start turning things up, like turn up the vocal, turn up the drums, turn up the bass, turn up and then I'm just making it louder. So I give every one of my clients the loudest mix possible and I just tell them when we go to mastering I'm gonna turn these down. And let the mastering engineer turn him back up after he does his EQ and processing. Mm -hmm. 
So now, how, now here's another question, also mastering related. Um, how many of your mixes end up, at, like your pure mixes, end up being used by the mastering engineer, and how many you're leveled up? Because I've been in situations, like with you, I didn't have a problem because you sent me a leveled up version for reference, but you also sent me the pure mix, and then right. I mastered it and get, give, you, give you what you wanted. Um, but how many, uh, but I've seen situations where, where artists um, send a, a listening copy to a mastering engineer, and he has to work with that. Right. How many yeah, times? I, I try to never let that happen. If, if a mastering engineer gets one of my leveled up mixes, it's because the artist sent it, and I didn't know that they were going to do that. Um, and that... So that has happened a couple times by accident, and usually, once I find out about it, we correct it if it if it needs to be, uh, and it's not a big deal. But mostly, I I'm the one that delivers the mixes to mastering, so usually that doesn't happen. And was there a situation where you specifically wanted a mastering engineer to use your leveled up mix because it had a vibe? Yeah, there was there's one mix that this year, um. This guy, Vino Allen from X Factor, uh, I think he was one of the runner-ups, 2012. Uh, kind of a real good rock, rock pop singer. Um, we had pushed his all his music into the master so hard, and it just got this sound that we all liked, and it we just got stuck with it. It was one of those things where it is what it is. If we start pulling things back, we lose that magic vibe that everyone started liking. So we just accepted it as this is going to be how we deliver it. And uh, we did turn, do a version where we turned it down and gave that to the master engineer, but we, we had a discussion with him telling him if he can't get that same vibe as our loud reference, then use the loud version um, and just don't do much to it. But uh, And we ended up using the loud version just because it kept that magic, and I think he added a little bit of high-end uh, on it, and that was it. So, but usually, I'm I'm not going that extreme with my master subgroups and master fader. Usually, stuff is pretty clean, and any kind of heavy lifting is done on the individuals. But that was one one rare instance. And, and what's your pet peeve with mastering engineers? What's that? What's the thing you hate? when you get to that process when you move the project forward to the mastering engineer? Oh. Um. I don't know. It, it, it's... I, I, the only th I think the thing I hate the most is when I get a, a master back and things have physically moved in the stereo field, not left to right, but forward to backward, like guitars that were set back in a mix are now up front and then sometimes I don't even know how they achieve that, but um, there's a couple of mastering guys that I just don't match well with. My mixes just, and his mastering, they just don't match. So I think that's the key is finding finding your few guys that you can rely on that have the same taste in Sonics as you do. Um, and like that's like what you, how you and I have. Like we, I think we like the same kind of sound in records. So. Uh, uh, same with Gene Grimaldi. He and I like the same kind of sound. Like, So whether it's you or Gene, I, I'm always comfortable getting records back from you guys because <clears throat> it's not going to be different than I imagined. You know? So. I see. Uh, do you, are you a believer of, of communication? Or just like, well, he has a taste, we'll go with what he thinks, or you like to discuss it? Um, I only really need to discuss it if if, uh, if someone has any concerns or issues or if we didn't quite achieve something and we're hoping that mastering can finish it off and, and get what we wanted. Um, otherwise, it's just trusting you guys to, to hear what we didn't hear in our own room. So if uh, having that second set of ears lets us know that we weren't quite bright enough and you add that little bit of brightness or maybe we were too bright because it was 4 a.m. and we were tired, and you just kind of catch that for us. Um, that's what I think mastering is all about: is, is is not screwing it up while 
while kind of giving a finished sound to the record, you know, as well as if you're mastering many records for one EP or album, making them all sound cohesive. Well, I, uh, I you know, we, we know and work with each other, so I just wanted to share that insights of what we both do to the people who are in the group. Absolutely. And, and give some responses regarding, you know, um, you know the communication and and how you know how to work with the gear. Uh, I think that one important thing is is a lot of times people look at these um, you know videos on YouTube or or just like we're doing right now hangouts and you know they're picking up information, but there's a few things that can really we can't explain as much as we'll talk. We'll never be able to explain and and it's. Um, we have to experience these things because they're not learnable by just hearing, like hearing numbers. Right? It's like you can say 100 hertz. 100 hertz for someone would seem one thing and for another one would seem a different thing. Right, absolutely. And, and uh, um, when, when Mahat was talking about you know, your experience with Michael Jackson, um, you know, thinking ahead of time and doing things up front, you know, you can't learn these things without being part of the process. You can only take that information and try to translate it in your world. Right. And, and I think that if, if anybody can come and maybe intern with you or, you know, even, you know, if even if, like, with Kalik and you can do, you know, with him explaining and all that, these things are valuable because we don't have them today as much. Your experience is based on what you've done throughout the years and you're putting it in your works. But right. somebody who's working at home who doesn't have your environment or my environment, they might not notice the low end and they don't they might not know they're boosting fifty hertz like crazy. You know? Right. And and that's why they they need, you know, this kind of mentoring. So it just if somebody would have to go, you know, with something, with one thing out of this uh, hangout with you, and it's one thing that applies to recording, to mixing, to mastering, to production, what would be the thing that you can say? Not not one word, but just a concept that they need to come out. Oh, <laughs> That's a tough one, man. Um... There's, there's never just one thing. I don't know. <laughs> there's a million things. One thing that you can think of that, you know, it's always complex, but, you know, you, you have to come, you know, when I go to see a, a, a lecture, I pick up a lot of things, but there's always one thing that just resonates with me. I think the, the, the most important advice I can give anyone is to never, never get comfortable. As soon as you get comfortable, you stop learning. And, man, I watch Dave Pensado every day work, and it's funny because he's still learning. He'll tell you he's still learning, and I don't see it. He just – he just he, – uh, he'll just turn around and start talking about something that he just figured out, and it's amazing someone that's been working uh, almost 40 years as a mixer. I mean, I've been working 20, and I still learn new things, and – you teach them to yourself more than you learn from YouTube and Pensado's place. Like the young guys might learn a lot from us on these videos, but not as much as you'll teach yourself mixing your own records and and being in the hot seat yourself. You'll, you learn so much more doing it. It's like the guys that are just learning, they're watching us play the guitar and we're saying, hey, this is how you do it. You put your hand here and you play these notes, but they're not holding the guitar. You gotta hold the guitar. That's that's the way you're gonna learn. So as soon as you get comfortable, you're gonna stop learning. So never never get too comfortable. Just always always be open to trying something new, and just be able to go back to the old thing, old standby. You know, at the drop of a hat if you need to. If that new thing isn't working. I, I think I think that was uh, very valuable what you just said about the comfort zone and. Um, I think that's what makes us better is that we we want to change what we are used to because we want to improve and that applies to me I think the best advice I've ever got was 
learning from my my mis mistakes or oh, mistakes. Yeah. And, yeah yeah I think I think that's that's very important and and just like you said you can show how to hold the guitar but if they don't hold the guitar they don't feel the guitar right so it's like it's like the saying I twist the knob till it sounds right well how do you know what sounds right <laughs> you want to figure out with yourself so yeah. uh, well, thank you for uh, you know uh, talking with me about this because I felt that this is something very important and uh, and, uh, yeah, and it's great to see you on this hangout. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people here, and there's a lot yeah, of them. here. Great. Well, um, I don't want to take too much of the time. There's people that want to ask more questions, but thank you very much. It was cool, and keep up the great work, Bob. Oh, thank you. You too, Mayor. Thank you. Cheers. All right, Bob, I've got a very difficult question for you, and I don't know if you're capable of answering this one. All right. You ready? I got my dictionary. How much is it going to cost for me to pay you to let me intern for a month where I do anything you say, just so that I can learn? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't charge you for interning because you'd be keeping the studio clean. So I'd, I'd have to charge you based on how nagging you were with questions <laughs> and for you it's gonna be a lot it's gonna be a lot <laughs> no not to be no, honest, I, I, to be honest, as long as I can get work done I, I welcome people to come hang out physically if they're if they're in town if uh, a lot of times I'm by myself and and I'm I have unattended mix sessions and I mean don't don't spread this across the internet but if someone wants to come hang and 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 chill, it, it's it's welcome most of the time. I've been I've been listening to a oh, Bob. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> here it goes. I've, I've been listening hey, to. Bob, a lot I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. I say, hey, I'm a, I'm gonna keep that uh, in mind because in October I will be in L.A. Okay. <laughs> I've been asking a lot of people about um, you know, what bugs them about interns. Uh, people being in the studio with them, and and like one of the things Ross said was, um, you know, just shut up, like be there and be quiet, not not offensive, like not to be offensive, but simply right. like you're not even there. And I, I've taken that to heart. So yeah, I wouldn't be in there asking you a million questions while you're trying to work. Yeah, um, I mean, I be obviously, I I like answering the questions, so I don't I don't mind people asking them, as long as it's not stopping me from getting my thoughts out in the mix while I'm working. So I usually tell people, write them down as they come to you. And then when I, when I, I take many breaks when I mix. So every 15 minutes I'll turn the speakers way down low and turn around and start talking to the person behind me. Maybe not every 15 minutes, maybe every half hour, hour. So at that point is the time to ask a question, you know, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty obvious with me or even Dave. Dave won't turn around for like an hour, and then all of a sudden he'll turn around for three hours and talk to you. So <laughs> that's the time to ask the questions. I had um I had my eyes closed right and and trying to hear right instead of looking at the knobs, and I was letting somebody come in, a little kid come in right while I was mixing, and with my eye I'm sitting there with my eyes closed. He hit he stopped the mix. He hit the uh, space bar. To stop the mix, to ask me a question. Oh wow! Uh. See, Bob, I cuss people out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, bruh, I dug into him. Like I, I went off. Um, not, not. I, I only used a few curse words that day, but I really gave it to him. He got a long lecture. <laughs> he turned, he, like I was his father. I, I could not believe that he had did that. He, he thought he was more important. <laughs> His question was more important than what was going on, um, and and but I learned I I learned something from him about uh, interning uh, by him doing that. He actually taught me a lesson on how how offensive or whatever you could you want to call it, it is to you know to mess up the session um, or interfere with with what's going on. But yeah, I would love to come in. I remember you guys had when I, when I came there, you guys had something asking about an intern, um, and I was telling one of the guys in my crew that they should. Um, Go there and do that. And one of them spoke about doing it, but he never took action on it. 
So right. I was like, you know what? I'll go. I'll go intern. I'm I'm humble enough to do whatever just so I can learn because for me the the money is the knowledge. That's the that's the currency that I'd rather deal in when right. I'm dealing with people is is give me the teach me how to fish that stuff. Right. Um, okay, that that API um, by that you were talking about the one that Waves makes, right? Yeah. Um, the API you know, twenty five hundred compressor. Yeah. Do you know if um, like if you were to put a, a, a gain plug in on after, say you're clipping the output of that the way you, exactly like you were talking, if you put a a gain plug in on after, like a trim plug in, and you turned it down, would it's would the plug in be clipping, but the output of that stage still be okay? No, that that's no different than just turning it down on the plugin. Okay, all right. I ask because the SSL, I think it's the channel. That's one of the, SS, the SSL channel strips. I actually, I got it from Bill, where we end up turning the um, I forget, I think it's the output up and it clips, but it, it's actually limiting, and you can okay. gain stage down, and then the next stage is not. Um, you can actually push into that compressor that the compressor from that point and it's and it's limiting but the next stage is not getting clipped the actual output of that stage um, next stage is the output of that master fader or uh, aux or whatever you're using that track is not clipping and it's an actual sound that we end up going for and I was right. I couldn't right. remember if that plug in did that or not yeah well that the the SSL channel strip has an input knob and then an output fader. Yeah, you, you can push the input knob up and hit the compressor harder, hit the whole plugin harder, but then you can take the output fader and turn it down to where it's not red lighting anymore, mm -hmm. and we'll have the sound of the 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 drive and the clipping without it actually clipping the output of that plugin. And um, so you were, go ahead. I was gonna say you can do the same thing with the. Uh, the new UAD 1073, you can drive the preamp knob, and uh, then it has this little output knob at the very bottom, this little tiny black circle uh, that you can turn down so it's not actually clipping the uh, the output signal, but the plug-in internally is clipping, uh, and it's it's going through some kind of its own algorithm, I'm sure, of, of distortion that sounds better than just clipping the plug-in. And what what I ended up what what we end up doing is like I'll I'll set up a say a reverb delay or whatever and I'll put the SSL channel on and I'll turn the actual input down and then clip the output with the output fader or whatever okay. and then there's a certain sound that I get that I end up liking and if I push into it more with a signal uh like if I turn a send up and it goes into that even more it's it it acts like a limiter but I'll put a trim plug in or something afterward and turn that sound down so that the track output doesn't clip and it, it actually it acts like a limiter and there's it's a cool I ended up loving the sound oh, okay yeah that's, that's cool. cool the uh, and and the API limiter or API compressor when I tried that years ago on the master fader what caught me was my stereo image stayed it yeah. it, it had less it did way less damage to the stereo image than all the other tools that I was putting on there and that that I found that let's just say very interesting because my I would put this stuff compressors on my master fader and my image would become more mono, but when I did the testing the the API it, it not only kept st uh, like stereo good but I heard like low level nuances better and I was really tripping out about that. Mm -hmm. So when you brought up this compressor I was like well, I, well I'll be damned like you you know saying you came to the yeah it's funny I've seen a lot of uh in the Pensado students page a lot of people not like that compressor and uh, I don't know if they're just not using it the way I am or or we just have different ears but but I really like that thing I, I only have really one setting I use but um, yeah I, th I think it's a good two bus compressor and see I, I love it I'll I, I, again my settings are opposite yours I'll put 1.5 to 1 soft knee and the race, the release as slow as it'll go, attack as fast as it'll go, and I'll get a lot of signal going into there. Um, no higher than um, negative eight dBFS coming in, like on a on a track, uh -huh. uh, through the plug-in, and and it'll. I like the sound. It it'll it grabs it and just keeps compressing, and I like the sound. 
don't know. It's, it, it, and that's on a vocal. I do that on a vocal. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like the sound. You know. Um, what else? Oh, Matt, back to mastering. If you're if if you were to send a song off to somebody and it's just one song, how much more would you actually push it? Um, or first, what would you expect out of the Matt? What do you ex actually expect out of the mastering engineer if it's just one song that you're sending to them? And how much more are you willing to push it on that song for results? Um, I I wouldn't I wouldn't do anything different with that song. I, I would do the same thing on my end that I would do if I was doing ten songs. But what I would expect from the mastering engineer is to do less than if he was including that song into a whole album. Um, and what I mean by that is if I've made a mistake where I, I printed that mix late at night, 6 a.m. in the morning, and my ears are tired, and it's just a little too bright, then I, I hope he evens that out. If I've nailed it, then I expect him to do as little as possible, especially if it's just a single one-off song. Just make sure he's got it as loud as, as it is competing with other commercial music um, without sounding bad, and, uh, and then be done. But if it's with a whole album, then I expect a little more... I would I would be open to him doing more because he might have to match that song to the others, and and might have to make a few more moves than he would as if it was just a single. Okay, um, James Mark Prey has a question for you. He says, um, on the Beto Cuevas. Yeah. Am I saying it correct? Yeah. He says. Um, let me, get it, let me get it back here one second. And I was wondering this. I, I actually had a question similar to this because you do the K-pop. He says, um, okay, every time I go to look at it, it, it jumps. Ba basically, how do you know that you're doing a good mix vocal-wise? Let's see. Um, he says, his bilingual, the bilingual album, there are some major transformations on his vocals. How were you able to work on Spanish vocals without losing the meaning? Do you speak Spanish, or is there someone there to work on it with you? And then tell us about that whole process, please. The the funny thing is the the producer and myself only speak English, um, so our last resort is is Beto himself coming in to hear the mix. So he'll catch anything that's not correct. But what I found with Latin music is as and maybe I'm wrong about this, but this is just what I've perceived, is it seems like the Latin music world likes the vocals louder than we do in in America. Um, or maybe that's just the, the what became popular in the mixing styles. So that's just kind of what we went for. Some of the vocals on, on Beto are pretty up there and loud. Um, emotionally, I, I can kind of feel the emotion no matter what the language is if they sang it very well you know if if they put their heart into it you can feel it no matter what they're saying uh, I, mean, I don't even have to know what the words are um, same thing in English sometimes I'm not really listening to what the sentence is that that person just sang what did that sentence mean but I still feel their emotion and how they sang it and I still know where to put the fader and and if I'm doing something too much and with one thing with the beta was we had to be sure not to over DS uh, because it's more noticeable to him than it was to us. Uh, so I had to leave the S's more open in order to keep Beto happy. Uh, same thing in K-pop. K-pop, um, I do very little DSing. I, I, I tried. Sometimes I have to take it all the way off, but uh, I can't do nearly as much as I can in English. Uh, cause and and K-pop it actually can change the meaning of their words. I don't know if that's the case in uh, with with the uh, Latin music, but with the Korean music, volume of syllables mean has different meanings with the same word. So you have to be careful. Even vocal rides are tricky. And I think I've just been lucky. Just you know, sometimes they'll tell me to tweak a word here and there, but. I've been okay in the Korean world and in the Latin world. And again, like I said, in the Latin world, it just seems like the vocals sit on top and you hear every syllable. And 
uh, maybe that's how it works, you know. Okay, um, Roger has a question for you. Cool. Hey, what's happening, Bob? Hey, Roger. Hey, um, I have a general question. Basically, I was listening to what you were just saying, and I'm sure you probably don't deal with this as much as some of uh, us smaller uh, guys do. But how do you how do you um, manage customers who have an idea of where they feel like a mix should go? But it's it's just really inappropriate, uh, and is the perspective is not really what it should be, at, you know, from a professional's uh, point of view, uh, you know. But obviously they're the customer, but but it's your name too, you know. So it's like, hey, that's a Bob Horn mix, and but it was really your customer's mix. <laughs> it wasn't really a Bob Horn mix. So how, how do you how do you deal with customers? Uh, who push you in a direction or try to push you in a direction that it it just really not appropriate because I I've had some situations here, uh, a couple here and there where I've had customers want me to do things and it's just it's just not what should be done. So I'm just kind of wanting to some perspective on that. Um, sometimes you can't win that fight and and you just have to go with it. And in certain cases would be, uh some of the famous people that are, are kind of diva-ish, um, that Everclear record that I mixed, it's, it's it lacks bass guitar a lot, in my opinion, because the artist just heard it that way. He heard it as with less bass guitar, and he heard it with a lot more high-end in the mastering. That, that album was pretty bright to me, and I can't really listen to it loud. It kind of hurts, and that was kind of a... It, that wasn't fun for me because that was one of my my only rock albums that was well known to come out and it didn't sound 100% like I liked it was only about 80% and at one point it was 100% before it got tweaked but he's the one in charge he's paying the bill it's his vision overall as an artist so at that point it's it's that's more of an opinion because it's it's an EQ thing it's a base level thing it's not it's not just completely ruining, and it doesn't make me look horrible. Yeah. Uh, if something were to just make me look horrible, where they just have turned the mix into this awful thing that I, I wasn't, I didn't have when they walked in, I'd probably just walk away from it and and ask not to be a part of the project. And um, I, I think that kind of thing. Um. I don't know. Depending on on who rep who recommended you to work on that project or how you found that project, a lot of times you can avoid those situations. If you're more of a um, in a smaller city where you you, you have to you can't pick your projects, you got to take more of, of everything that comes through. Or maybe you're a studio owner and the engineer, and you got to keep the lights on in the studio. You got to do every project, whether it's Joe Schmo the rapper or um, you know, Donna Summer, superstar, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you won't have those choices and you just get them out the door. And I think that's a little safer because people recognize the studio as as a whole and the average of what they've done. So if you've got a good list of clients and a couple ratty projects came out, you're a little safer than a, a pure mixer that's trying to only mix high-end uh, clientele when possible. No. Right. So, <laughs> it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, I only had one project I ever had to walk away from, and the singer, the singer couldn't even. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were to look at the singer's vocal on Melodyne, <laughs> compared to the, mel the melody he was supposed to be on, he was up to three, four steps off of the note at all times. Wow! So it just wasn't a professional project, mm -hmm. and it was attached to a very big name, and. Uh, was a famous person's grandson, and they were just kind of entertaining the grandson, and they hired some good people to work on it, and, and we all kind of walked away from it. So yeah. that's all that happened really once. Yeah, I was just I was just curious. Uh, you know, I am a studio owner, and and I I have been blessed to be able to work on some some pretty decent projects. But you do kind of, in, at least for me, I've reached a point where a couple of times where I have literally had to walk away. Yeah, uh, and just basically explain to the customer that I just didn't feel like, you know, it was a good fit, 
uh, you know, for where they wanted the project to go. Um, you know, and I, I'm just, I just thought to bring that out because perhaps maybe some other people on, you know, here on the forum perhaps have yeah. encountered it. I haven't encountered it a lot, but, but I think at some point, you know, at some point, um, you know, I, I feel like there's a certain, we, we can reach a certain, uh, you know, place where we kind of had to protect ourselves a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I am from the school. If a man want a can of soup, give him a can of soup. <laughs> you know, but but not at not to the detriment of, of, of my course. name. Of course. Know, so. I, because I, at I the end of the day, our work is our resume. Yeah, absolutely. I think the best way to walk away is just portray to that artist that or that that person you're working with that you're just not the right guy for the job. Yeah. You know, just put it on you. Let them, you know, not necessarily talk bad about what they're doing. Just tell right, them. Right. This isn't for you. You're not the right guy. You're not the right match. And let him move on. You know. Yeah, and that's exactly and that's exactly what I did. Uh, yeah. You know, I just explained that I just didn't feel like it. I was going to be the best fit and, and give them the result that they were looking for. And yeah. uh, you know, I just was honest with them. And uh, I, I I just wanted to kind of perhaps there may be other people that have encountered something like that. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. I I, I assume that you would say what you said. Yeah. Uh, can, can I uh, give my two cents on it? No. Sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> You're nickel. Um, patience is a muscle. We got to work, okay? And sometimes a client can be like, uh, you know, weightlifting for us, or it could be, you know, like like going to the gym, you know what I mean? It, it, you start to, you know, you start sweating just talking to him because he's like going to, you know, do this, do, you know what I mean? It's like sometimes... Um, it's a good idea to just let go, but sometimes it's a good idea to actually try more because um, one, you can win the client and he can come back to you. And second thing, sometimes that stretch is exactly what you need to open up another idea. You know, like, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. You know, sometimes, um, you know, the saying the client is always right, it's, it's, it's wrong to say that, but it's a saying because you kind of have to work with your client. Um, I think that every professional has a bag of great material that he worked on, or at least great to his, you know, uh, perspective, and okay material and bad material. Right, Bob? I mean, you probably have some stuff that's hidden in your closet nobody knows of that you're not proud of, right? Yeah, and, and usually, I mean, in, in most of those cases, it, it would see either bad production or bad songwriting and out of my control and, and if, if you can one thing I, I've learned from Dave Pensado if, if you can make turn those moments into teaching moments and this is all based on if the client is is open to it and give them advice whether to you know work harder on your songwriting mm -hmm. you'll get better songs from better writers that you give to your artist as a manager or um, I, I I stopped the session and Last year, I was uh, doing some vocal recording um, for three days, and the first day, I stopped it and sent him home and told him it was a friend of mine that was investing in this young uh, young girl as a pop artist, and I told him, don't waste three days of your money with me right now. Go get her vocal lessons for at least two months, and then come back, and your three days will be much more better used. And that was a teaching moment, and because we were friends, he was open to it. And it, he did it, and it was successful. The, the girl came back a much better singer, much more confident. Rather than me just taking their money and in and, and my head saying, oh, she's horrible, she's never going to be famous, let me just get this money and move on to the next project. So if the client can be open to, to learning something or taking some advice, then absolutely you know, turn it into a teaching moment if possible. Uh, may I step in, actually? Um, I had a question for you and for Mayor. Uh, Mayor, I, I know um, what you do, and I know your work, and um, I know Bob's work, obviously. And um, my question is about mastering and about... And I don't mean to, to be... I know this is controversial, and I don't mean to be rude at all. But my question is about mastering and about um, the need for mastering in, in modern-day recording and modern-day music. And what your thoughts on on it were? Um, I've been doing just briefly. I've been doing this since about '95, 
um, you know, worked in seconding in studios and stuff, and I got out of it for a while, and I'm just getting back into it, and I've seen things change a lot, and the formats have changed a lot, and and the master was always seen as um, kind of a black art, and when when there was vinyl and when there were cassettes, it was really um, uh, really important, really you know ne necessary to kind of have somebody who specialized, and anyway, especially when we had lathes and stuff. But now that um you know things are different, formats are different, um, and and I think skill sets and knowledge have been widened and are spread by stuff like this. I'm uh, wondering what uh, what. We, I'm sorry. I didn't hear. I was thrown out of the. Sorry, Mayor. I I bottom line is, I'm wondering what you and Bob think about self-mastering and uh, and especially with formats having changed um, with knowledge having changed with with our um, access to, to good equipment having changed Bob you be first um, well what I would say is is on a on a single standpoint if you're if you just have one song if you can nail that mix a hundred percent and get the volume that you want, and it's not going to be on an EP or an album, then maybe you can get away with self-mastering. No one may know. Uh, but a lot of what a lot of people forget what mastering, it, it's not just the plugins or the gear that's used. It's a mindset. And guys, mastering engineers can do things, even emotionally on a track. It's not just, is it too bright or too dull? We do. We I talk about it like that because I'm not in their head, but I've uh I've asked you know I, I've worked with different mastering engineers and sat in on our sessions and they'll do a track and right before they move on to the next track I'll ask them what did you do and some of them be, will be like oh I did two tenths of a dB at 10k and that's very technical and other guys will be like well the vocal kind of felt like it was not speaking to me on the bridge so I brought that out a little bit. And I'm thinking, well, it's a two-track. How the heck did you do that? And that's the kind of mastering stuff that we forget about when we're just throwing on an L1 on the two bus and trying to get it as loud as possible. So mastering to the guys that know how to do it, it's, I still think it's a very important process. Um, your question is, is kind of funny because I'm in a situation right now where I did a whole album and my my mixes were everyone was really happy with them and it's it's 11 songs and we had it mastered and it came back quieter than all of the mixes that I had been letting the the band live with and but at the same time the mastering was so super consistent from song to song it really sounded like one cohesive album so on one hand you put all my mixes on a CD and it felt great and it was nice and loud, not overly loud. It was just the perfect loudness. And then you put the mastering guys, masters of my mix on a CD, and they're not as loud and they don't feel as great, but they're super consistent. So it's this toss-up. The band's like, well, should we just go with Bob's mixes? And I, I had to tell them, no, give the, the mastering guy one last shot. Tell him the problem. Tell him the concerns and see what he can do. And, um, Hopefully we can get the consistency that I didn't achieve, um, but we'll get the feeling that we had off of my mixes. So, and for that that consistency, uh, I think it's better suited for a mastering a mastering engineer to do. Or I don't have as much time to do that. I could sit here, but then all of a sudden I'm mastering. You know, if I take on that role and, and trying to do those, you know, those you kind. Know, I I'm so, I'm so sorry, uh, Mara. I, I I'd want to know what you what you feel about that, but I, I guess my question before you even answer is, isn't this a skill set that we as engineers should have anyway? You know, isn't this really just a continuation of our skill set rather than a, a specialization? Right. Well, um, you know, Bob gave a, a a lot of info about that 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 comes from a mixing engineer side, and and he, you know and. He actually, you know, he mentioned exactly the things that a lot of people don't think about it. It's not just a technical side. It's an emotional side, you know, because in the end of the day, you know, when Bob finishes his mix, he knows every little thing in that mix. He knows where he added a point three on on a vocal or a 
whatever on the i uh, hi hat. And, and so he already, you know, he already went to the micro parts of it and and made it fine. Now the next stage is being the buffer between him and the listener. And and that's what the mastering engineer is. He's taking from the professional sound created in a professional studio or in a other environment could be home studio, but he's taking it to the consumer level. Okay? And that's where things can get lost in translation because the consumer doesn't have the monitoring space that the producer or mixer has. He has a different environment. And there's uh, things that could get lost in that translation. Could be emotional stuff, could be technical stuff. You know, it could be, just like Bob said, if you're at, what, 4 a.m., you know, already all day, like 14-hour mix, you're not hearing how much 6K you pushed. You're not hearing how much low-end your room might be absorbing all the time and you're not noticing it. Or you might not noticing that the vocals are actually a bit hidden, but because you worked on it so much, you know the lyrics by heart. It's it's often that I get a mix that the vocals are a bit buried, and it, and the guy knows exactly the lyrics. The producer, the mixer, everybody knows the lyrics because they've been hearing it for so long. But when I hear it, I'm right. like, they're a bit buried, right? That right. can happen. And so. Uh, or sometimes, an example, a hi-hat. You'd be surprised how many times you'll get a mix with, with this loud hi-hats. And you're like, wow, didn't they notice it? And, and it's taking the focus of the song. The hi-hat on your left or your right is like, and you can't expect the mixing guy who's been working 14 hours on this to notice it uh, all the time, you know? Uh, of course, if they're good, they're good. But sometimes they don't notice it. So, hey guys, it's, hey, you know, can I chime in just for a second? I, I'm not, I'm not a Grammy winning uh, mastering engineer, but I do master a lot, uh, you know. And one of the things that that I, I think that gets missed by a lot of people who talk about mastering, they, it's only the creative side of it. I never hear any of the technical things that need to happen to go along with delivering the record for uh, replication, you know. Uh, any of that other technical stuff that happens, the metadata tagging, the ISRC, the you know, you know, I, the, Roger, I'm not to cut you off. I mean, I, I'm I'm talking about the PQ coding and DDP delivery. I, I get that, but but you know, a lot of I, I could probably name two mix engineers that even knows what an ISRC is. <laughs> <laughs> so so I guess what I'm saying is is that you know, chiming in on behalf of the mastering engineers. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff that that get that happens on the back end uh, aside from the creative thing that I think it just gets missed out. I can't tell you how many record labels I've talked to or artists that I've talked with that are signed to record labels that are now independent and they don't know anything about you know any of that. <laughs> you know, so that's it's just another added thing to do. You know, besides the artist, and I understand where uh, what you were saying, but I just wanted to just kind of. Bring that out because I don't. I don't think it was, you know, kind of adequately talked about or whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's so, true. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say the other thing is, I don't know what the exact number is, but but maybe sixty, seventy percent of people that mix records, because because we're not just mixing major label records now. We're mixing these <laughs> uh, bands, you know, in small cities like. There's so many studios out there making music. So very few of them have a room as nice of, of like what a mastering engineer has or what I have. Um, some guys are still old school and they move studio to studio every week. They're mixing in a different room. Um, you can't expect those guys to, to nail a 100% mastered record right off their mix bus. Um, I, I actually wanted to build my own studio because I was envious of these guys like Dave Pensado and, and Manny Mariquin that were in a room for a decade with the same speakers and the same walls. And that, that's such a mass that used to such be a mastering thing. And they spent, and there's so much money spent on the acoustics. And so I've built myself a room that's, that's suitable for mastering. My room is impeccable. And I spent a lot of money on it because it's something I desired as a mixer to have that consistency, come to the same room every day with the same speakers and, we were talking earlier about low end and how important it is to have a good room, but when you're a producer creating tracks and 
you're mixing your own projects, it's so hard to, you know, you, you know you have a bass build up behind your desk, but to spend 300 bucks on a bass trap when you can buy the new slate plugin, it, it's it's too hard of a thing to do. Right. You can't expect guys uh, in those positions to ever have uh, uh, the ability to hit a home run every day on every mix as the mastering engineer. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but me, I can't master my own record, like sit down and master an album and mixes I do. I can EQ the two bus at the end of a mix, but I need some. I want someone else to take a shot at it with another set of ears and just verify if I did something right or wrong. I can. I've done mastering for other for my friends, other engineers, but it wigs me out to try to do it on my own stuff. I end up doing the same EQ I did on the two bus, and I'm just repeating myself, and it starts to sound weird. So I like having another guy on it. You know, those are the the three big like arguments I guess that I hear against it are are I want a, a second set of ears. Um, yep. That my room isn't going to be as good as a mastering engineer's room, and um, really, it's about the gear. Like mastering, gear, you know, they'll have eight thousand dollar EQs or whatever. And sure. I, I guess my 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 argument against it, and, and I don't really want to sound combative by any stretch, because sure. I, I completely defer to you guys. But I guess my argument against it is, you know, I know what I want my mix to sound like. I don't want somebody else's input on it. You know, right. I am. Um, you know, with with the gear that we're all dealing with with mixing, you know, and, and that we've got access to with mixing now, you know, the converters that we've got access to, you know, isn't that really at the same level that? And I know it's not exactly the same level that a mastering engineer facility would have, but but certainly is close enough to be able to to be repeatable and to get within a half yeah. a dB of stuff. You well, know, can, can I say something too? Can I interject something sure. real quick? Um, you know. A lot of times, okay, if I'm doing a project that, you know, is anything and I can't afford to um, do it, like, for example, I might send something to Master to Roger, for example, because I know I know where his thought process is, and it's going to be different. You know, when I was up there with uh, Roger a couple, a few weeks back, um, and we were working on a song, and the thing that I like about him is the difference of what he's hearing than what I'm hearing. And, and I think a mastering engineer a lot of times is going to – there's some things, man, that, that another perspective just – it can't really hurt. You know, and a lot of times, you know, I think the, the main way to look at it is, is because there's some things that I've done myself, and I'm like, man, it seems like I'm, I, I want it to sound a certain way, right? But uh, I remember going in, in, to Nashville to this place called Master Mix, and they pretty much – um, would do started doing uh, uh, country. They were doing known for country, but I mastered with this guy named Ken Love, I believe. Yep. And um, and I would um, you you hip to him, uh, Bob? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, you know, and we talked, and and he was telling me about the uh, the guy that owns the place. How he you know he started when he was young there, and he kind of started doing runs, and he started working on the master stuff. But Ken's been there for a long time. And but the thing that I learned, man, sitting in the mastering session. He, there are just a whole bunch of other things that a master and engineer is just beneficial. And I think I, I, I think we can't become bigger than the music in a sense. And, and that's really what I'm saying. A lot of times I think I like things even when I'm mixing something that I might produce. But, man, there have been so many times where I've sent it to a, ma a master and engineer um, and it's just like, you know, like there's a guy in Atlanta by the name of Glenn Schick that for some stuff I'll run it and send to Glenn Schick and say, hey, um, what, and he'll hit me back, and he'll say some stuff that, as creative as I thought I was being, you know what I'm saying? Hey, you might want to check this, and this is sounding a little bit too grainy. It sounds like, you know, the snares are a little choked a little bit. It sounds like they need to be opened up. Um, and I think, you know, it's like a, it's like two different aspects. You know what I'm saying? You might, you, you have one part of the process, but I think sometimes doing everything yourself. I think it's you. You almost always overlook something. You know what I'm saying? Because because we're married to our own perspective and our own thought process. But for me, man, the benefit of growth, for example, is stuff like this. This kind of stuff is the stuff that makes me go back and say, "Man, I've been doing it like this. Let me try this." And right. you know, and, and, it's and just, if um, I could interject on that, but and I and I apologize. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm what no, I'm okay. saying is is um. A, a second perspective is invaluable, no question. 
I mean, yeah. I have people who hear like trust. Like, uh, what do you think about this? How would you think? You know, how would you attack this? Or, you know, I, I can't get the low end right. How do you feel? But I wouldn't hand my mix over to him. You know, I wouldn't say like, okay, now I'm done. You take over. And I guess right. that's really what I'm saying. You know. Well, just just to play devil's advocate, I, like I said earlier, I've had a few times this year where the master came back worse, and uh, and a couple times I just worked with the guy or. Um, a couple times we just went with the mix. It was like one, I think one time we just abandoned the mastering and went with the mix and it can happen. That, that's the thing. It's a team effort and sometimes you pick the wrong guy. Like like I have, along with Mayor, I have like four or five other guys that I, I try to pick what I think matches their sound as a mastering engineer the best. And <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, if you listen to stuff like Swedish House Mafia and, and some of that, uh, I think it happens a lot more in electronic dance music where they don't actually master, they don't send their stuff out to mastering, they, they just do it themselves and some guys just don't, they want their control freaks. Like I'm a control freak on the mix and I guess I can let go for mastering but I understand man, someone, there's always that chance that your, your, your mix gets messed up and not too late. No, I, I had this one experience uh, where I, I was working on a mix and I made myself a mental note, I need to go back and edit these guitars and we got ready to send it to mastering and we'd been listening to this mix for, gosh, probably four or five months You know, while we were working on the whole album and I sent it to the mastering engineer and he said, you know you got wrong notes in the guitar and I went, Oh crap! I forgot to go back and do the edit. You know, so you know, working on stuff. You know, it, it to me, like I say, it's it's great to have another set of ears on it. But uh, I mean, I just thought that was, you know, extremely telling. Uh, and, and the other thing that I keep trying to tell the guys here is, you know, not just a studio owner, but also as a label owner. Um, you know, I keep trying to tell the guys, um, you know. Henry Ford might have built his first car by himself, but I guarantee you, he didn't build the second one by himself. You know, it. it you know, it, it, to me, the the question of mastering is, um, you know, if if you believe in the product, um, I, I'm I, I feel like I've got to trust a mastering engineer. Um, because that's another set of professional ears that are on on my product. They're helping me to deliver to my client the best product that I possibly can. You know, that's that's what they're paying for. Um, you know, now granted, I, I'm an, I'm not in a situation where I'm actually creating the music. I'm, I'm you know I'm a recordist. I'm a mixer and, and a label owner. I, uh, my playing days are pretty well over, except for you know going out and having fun and you know drinking a couple of beers and raising hell with the guys. But uh, as far as trying to actually be a uh, content creator, um, you know, I, I think that my perspective might be different if that were the case. But, you know, like I said, as, as a recordist and as a mixer, uh, you know, I want to be able to deliver to my clients the best possible product that I can. And that does really mean that I need to, you know, let go of certain aspects of it. Uh, you know, I need to be able to trust somebody. And if, you know, if they're not delivering what the, the client wants, I always tell them, tell the guy, you know, talk to the mastering engineer. You don't, you know, this isn't, you know, a, a one-way street. Uh, you know, it, it, it is all about, you know, communicating with your mastering engineer. Uh, I don't know, just my two cents. Right. Can I? Can I respond to that? Um, I think communications is key in anything. And a lot of times in this music industry, instead of communicating, we miscommunicate. People are assuming things. People are taking, um, they're taking too much responsibility on themselves. And the product, in some cases, suffers from it. I'm not talking about just specific projects, but if you look back in history, uh, you'll see that you had less access to tools as you have today. Okay, I mean, you know, open your computer. How many plugins do you have? A hundred, two hundred. 
think of those if they were hardware gears. You know, they will be filling your room, right? So you have access to so much gear today. Does that mean that the quality of a product you have is higher? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means you have accessibility to to tools to create such a product, but it doesn't mean you always have it. And back in the day, more people were involved in creating the albums. You had assistant engineers, you had interns, you had engineers, you had when Pro Tools came in, Pro Tools operators, you had mixing engineers, you had you know the guys who just edit, you had you had a lot of people involved in, in making such a product. Uh, Bob, how many people were you involved when you were working with Michael Jackson? And that's at the later stage. Of Michael Jackson. Uh, that was that was actually pretty small. That was probably five people. Five people. Okay. And that's, that's probably that's small. Yeah. That's considered small today. Okay. Now look at like you no know, back then. Back then, let's say uh, Dangerous or Thriller. How many people were involved? Uh, probably fifteen or more. At, at least those yeah. are the people that we knew of, not the people who were transferring the tapes or you right. know they were people who were aligning the, the machines, the tape machines, and teching. I mean, there were a lot of people involved in creating such a great product. And and I, I know that me being a mastering engineer, I'm trying to kind of, you know, tell, I'm not trying to promote my service, but I'm trying to explain that, you know, you can do it on your own. Yes, you can do. You can mix on your own. You can track on your own. You can do everything on your own. That doesn't specifically say that that product is going to be the best, and and you just need to put as much effort as you can. Um, on the technical side, yes, DDP, um, ISTAR C codes, all that stuff. Yeah, that's part of a mastering engineer when he does an album. But even in a single, you know how many times I find myself returning a mix, not because my ego is saying, oh, you could do better because I'm better. No, it's just like, oh, you didn't notice that. You know how many times I would tell a client, your album flow, I think, you know, your album flow is nice, but if you change the, the placement of this song and this song, your album would sound better because the flow would be better. Um, back in the day when records were, were cut, you know, there was physics involved. You couldn't put certain songs in the end of a side. Otherwise, they would sound weird. Right. So there were, there were physical elements involved, but also today... You know, um, you know, Bob, you're you're a highly qualified, highly trained, highly, and you choose to work with a mastering engineer. That says a lot, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, of course, you know how to operate a compressor and AQ, but you make the decision to take it out of your hands, right? Yeah. Well, I'll be honest. Like, there's people EQ differently than me. If you just want to talk EQ of a, of a song. Um, my stuff really never needs compression. If it does, it's very light. That's just the style that I mix. It's it's pretty much compressed and limited on its own. And again, I'm talking just about that one aspect of mastering. But uh, when it comes to EQ, there's a way that some guys, especially mastering engineers, can EQ high end that I'm not good at, and I haven't found out how to do on my mixes. And it's something I kind of wait for on my mixes, and some of them, if it never gets it, it still sounds like a great mix, but some of them I get the mastering back, and I'm like, oh, yeah, they did that thing that I like, and that's cool, and I've tried to do it with the Clarifonic EQ and the Mog Air Band and, and just, uh, the you know, the Massenberg MDW EQ, and I just, something about it leaving my system and going into, whether you're using Sonic Solutions or Wave Lab, and then it coming back to me, there's something that a lot of times I like about that, and if I was going to try to do it on my own, I guess I'd buy a Wave Lab rig and set it up next to my Pro Tools rig and buy maybe the uh, Cube Tech EQ or uh, you know something like that, but I don't need to do that. I'll just let a master guy do it because he's going to do so much more on top of that. But they, uh, Those guys have a sonic sound just like we have a sonic sound, and sometimes it's cool to add that on top of our mix. Oh. Tell us how it's done, Mayor, right now. What you right say? Right now. To tell us how that's done, right now. Oh, I can tell you. I was. I, I'll. I'll just throw the secret out there. I was just doing an album, um, and I was telling my client, basically, we're like make 
professionals. We we can't control how the face is, but we can alter the mood of it just by putting layers of something. You know, if we want to make it more edgy, we'll add high mids. If we want to make it softer, we'll warm it up. And maybe you know, soften the high end or boost the low end. Basically, you know, it's it's all conceptions. You know, by the way. Um, 1K on one EQ doesn't equal 1K on the other EQ. That's the reason you have a bunch of EQs to work with, because one will do it in a certain way. Uh, in my rig, uh, which some of you probably have seen in some of the Google Hangouts we've done, I have one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, uh, seven, seven or eight EQs, depending on what I want to connect. And each one sounds differently, you know. So, um, you know, uh, um, and Bob's sound is very round to begin with, okay. So even trying to add low end, that's a risk. You can actually ruin his great mix by trying to overemphasize what he already has. So you have to be really careful. A lot of times in mastering is what not to do, where a lot of people think, Oh, you're gonna add this and that and this and that. No, sometimes it's knowing where not to. And um, Bob mentioned today about filters, and filters is one of the most unknown territory, I think, because filters actually, like you said, they boost in a way. Yeah. And it, it, it takes a long time to figure how certain filters work. Sometimes I can cut frequency. And it's not an audible frequency, and then boom, I get a clip. Like, how did that come? And I, I know it's because of the filter, but that's something very elusive. And filters are very different than EQs in that way because a lot of times you're not hearing the whole picture of that filter, and it's boosting. Like, how many times did you uh, put a filter, Bob, and it boosted your low end? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you one thing. That Mayor does, which is nice when you get something mastered. He usually sends me two versions of the master. One is usually a little more dynamic and wider, and then the other one is usually driven a little hard, has almost like a not a saturation, but just a color to it. And it's it's driven a little harder, a little bit louder. And he gives me the choice to pick, and that's kind of cool because I wasn't doing either one of those on my own two bus, and now I have these two different masters that are. They're very subtle. I, I almost have to put them next to each other and go back and forth and A B, but um, it it it's two different colors that I didn't have in my mix that now I get to choose from, and uh, I don't know. You can definitely self master, but there's the most interesting thing I've ever seen is Bernie Grunman. I did a uh, Brian Culbertson uh, album, smooth jazz album, and I looked at his recall sheets that the assistant filled out. On every song, so I was so excited to know what did he do on my mixes and how much did he have to do. And on the ends, 26k and 20 hertz, he was boosting 26k and cutting 20 20 hertz. And I was like, what the heck is that doing? That that doesn't seem to be doing anything. And a couple of the songs, that's all he did. There was nothing in the mid range. So I ran home with the CD ref popped it in and had my CD and I put them both in Pro Tools and I'm going back and forth and it was so different from my mix like drastically and we're talking ha like five tenths of a dB half dB on the edges just adjusting that I was blown away and that, that I don't even know what that is or, or what that was doing Mayor probably knows but that I'm definitely not going to do that in my self mastering I'm going to do a 10k shelf and stuff you probably shouldn't be doing <laughs> well, part of the secret, really, is that every mastering engineer set his rig based on his preference. And, you know, it's years of training it and, and figuring out what you like best. Just like, Bob, you picked that, uh, you know, you picked those Daking compressors and the Joe Meek and the Manly because throughout, you know, your years of work, you, you found yourself... Uh, connecting to it more and it fits more of the things you like, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's not just you bought it because it's it's just the name. You bought it because you liked it. And exactly. same thing, same thing with a you know with a mastering rig or a desk, whatever you you want to call it. 
uh, I pick and choose my gear based on me liking what it does and the combination. And that's a lot of the, the secret behind it is, you know, you have to have good aesthetics to, to understand what you're listening for or, you know, trained aesthetics or you can learn them, of course. But it's also about what you connect with what. That 20K and 20 hertz uh, cut and boost that, 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 brought, uh, that uh, was it uh, Bernie or Brian who did it? Uh, Bernie? Uh, yeah, Bernie. With Bernie. What he did, you can't copy that on your EQ because that's his EQ. It's custom. Yeah, it's not it's, a brand name. <laughs> right. It's not even, yeah, it's, it, actually, they, they, they built it themselves there. But it's not only that it's their own, it's in a system that works in a certain way. It's his gain amps, it's his um, signal chain. Just like when I do, if I'll do a 20K boost, it's not going to sound like a 20K boost on a different setup or a different plugin. And, and that's part of the secret. It's the same with mixing engineers. You know, they have their chains that they're using for their kick, for their snare, for their overhead, just like any other big mixer guy that has his own setup, you know, you're hearing his setup. It's not just his ears, but it's his setup. So when I when I gave Bob the two versions, they were subtle differences, but they were noticeable, right? Yeah. But, but you could hear each one had a different approach, and it's because how the chain is reacting to those changes. So um, you're talking about self-mastering. Yeah, you can self-master, and you'll use your own plugins or setup. But then you're using the tools that you're always using. You're not bringing new spice to the cooking, you know, to your to your meal. You're right. using the same spices, which could be good, but why not have a different set? And it could be just like Bob said, half a dB here, half a dB there, or even just half a dB in a six point, you know, and a twelve dB per octave or whatever filter it was, a twenty-four or six. But it will sound different, and that's that's the reason. If you give me your wave file, even if I don't do anything to it, okay, I promise you it's gonna sound different. Even if I don't apply any EQ, just by running my own signal chain with no no boost, it's gonna sound different. And it's because it's a different signal chain. You know what's crazy? Um, I was messing with SoundForge back in the day. I, I did a two. I would do two track bounce. I would bounce to two tracks, right? The stereo bounce. Throw it in the SoundForge, and um, I know that when I cut, do that low end cut with a steep filter, the I'll get these peaks. So if it was peaking at negative eight, it would jump up say three dB or whatever. And so I would put a limiter on, and have the limiter not do anything and be right there to where if I go even point one more. I would see limiting, so the limiter's not doing anything, and I and I put a steep 20 dB, uh, 20 hertz cut on there, and that's all I did, and then bounced it down, and the audio went from being smooth like I had it to jumping. Frequencies were jumping, and I thought that was the craziest thing back back in the day, but that let me know when I started mixing, doing stuff with people, I actually use that knowledge. Like, there's also, I do okay. Do any of you guys ever? Boost lower frequencies to get the audio to not jump as much. In mastering, you mean, or mixing? Anything, I whatever. I, you know what? I think in the past, um, it really it's client dependent and territory dependent. Um, for example, you know when I work, you know I do a lot of international work. So when I get stuff from Europe, I always try to find like information about it. Like if somebody's sending me. A rock song. I'm like, what are you, French rock, British rock, Swedish rock? Because each one of them sounds different, and each one has a different perspective of low end. Low end in Europe, in, in Scandinavian country, is, is different than low end in England. England has a very, you know, British rock has a very warm low end. It's not big, but it's very warm and nice. Um, Scandinavian low end is a bit more aggressive, and it doesn't have that warmth. And it doesn't extend to certain areas. It might be subby more, but or or cut the subs and more high end. But it's different. And um, I usually don't put low end to mask problems on high end. But some sometimes it's a solution. But I don't think it's the go-to solution. 
I think first if you can fix the problem in the mix, fix it in the mix. And usually the problems are hiding in the high end and the low end. Um, a lot of times you'll have too much high end, but you don't know that because you have too much low end. You know, Bob, what I'm talking about, that there's too much high end information, but the low end is masking it? Yeah. And then when you clean up the low end, all that high end problems pop up. Yeah, I mean, you, you can... That's a crazy thing. You can, you can do one EQ move on the opposite end of a spectrum, and it'll change. Like, you can cut an 80 hertz shelf, half a dB, and all of a sudden your mix is harsh. Like, 2K and 3K all of a sudden hurt because yeah. that 80 hertz was, was covering that up and smoothing that out. So uh, that happens to me a lot where I'll do one EQ move, and all of a sudden I hear two more EQ moves I have to do to make that first EQ move work. Yeah, I would I would cut lows and my 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 audio would start jumping at my ears. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> um, oh, Phil Dubnik, ring a bell? Yeah, of course. He's uh, let me read his comment. He says, uh, when you guys said, I'm sure you have some not so great projects in your closet when you <laughs> first got started. Uh, he says, I was like, I know he does, because I was the artist. I was that not so great artist. No, Phil wasn't actually. <laughs> Phil's music was awesome. I was, I was, uh, I was really actually really excited to work on that project. But um, no, nah, his his project was great. Phil's a great writer, man. He's really good. And is Brad? Are you still around? Because Brad, um, Brad had a question for you. Um, uh, he he stepped away, and I forget who wanted to go after Brad. Who was supposed to go after Brad? Uh, I didn't step away. Oh, Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, I didn't step away. You just had me muted. Uh, okay. Yeah, Bob. Um, I come from a, a different perspective than than most of the guys that are that are here. Uh, I do what I call vocal pre-production. Okay. And so my work is to to and I learned this from from working with other producers. My job is to prepare a vocalist for you in the best possible way so that you get the best possible performance out of the vocalist. But one of the things that helps me is to know what kinds of, of, of things that you do to bring the most important part of the vocal performance out, which is the emotional part. The, uh, the hardest part would with vocals is is their comfort and when they're ready to sing the song and when they know the song actually that's what I see the most these days is young artists come in and they have lyric sheets or they're getting handed the lyric sheet from the songwriter and they don't know the song and it's funny you you audition a female pop singer and you ask her to sing something she sings a Whitney Houston song that she's sung for 10 years and she nails it, and everyone's impressed. And oh, we should give her a rec give her a record deal and get her in the studio. And then you hand her something she's never sung before, and and there's nothing there. It's it's horrible. There's no emotion. <clears throat> so, anytime that I, I I rarely produce, I I mostly mix. But in those few times where I produce, I I usually ask the singer to have the song memorized and have sung it for a few weeks, and and really make it their own. Um. I was developing an artist last year and we would write the song and then he'd be ready to jump in the booth and record it. And I'd see, I'd say, no, come back in two, two weeks, take it home with you, practice it. And it made, it made the biggest difference in the world. And just that, that one basic first step of them really knowing it, not having the lyrics in the booth. If they're reading, they're not feeling, you know, they, they, they can't, take a lyric and, and feel it and what the emotion means and what the words mean to them if they're reading it off the page or or even if they if they just memorized it yesterday and they're trying to remember what's that next line there's not going to be any feeling so my first thing is is them being ready to sing and then them being comfortable to sing like if I do a vocal session I'll usually book it a four hour session but I'll block out the whole day that way if they if they wake up ready to sing We'll get over there at 10 a.m. Um, or they might say, "No, I'm going to sing tonight," 
And so I, all right, no problem. We have the whole day. We'll get there at 8 p.m. And then they sing at 8 p.m. So whenever they're the most comfortable and, and, and the most ready to sing and they know the song and make sure the, the vocal booth is actually vibed out for them to where they feel nice or are they better with being here in the control room with me? Do they want, you know, the assistant to step out of the room? It's just all about them being so comfortable that they can lose themselves in the song. And uh, sometimes they won't fess up to what's bothering them. And it could just be that the assistant is in the in the corner reading a magazine and somehow that's bothering them from from you know performing and uh you, you think that'd be funny because they're you know six months later going to get on a stage in front of thousands and perform it but when you get in that studio they they act a whole different way so. yeah that's that's why i use the word pre-production uh so much in in my work because the more i like I say the more i can prepare them for you then the easier it goes. But I'm always looking for new ideas from you all. Um, working with Brian Vibberts right now on a project. And uh, it was interesting because the vocalist really, he wrote the song, but there was no feeling at all. Huh. And so now, you know, after going over it with him, and, and he knew the song really, really well, but what, what you said there is, is the brain can't focus on two things at the same time. The, the conscious mind can't. The subconscious can, but the conscious mind can't. So if they're reading lyrics or, or if they're wondering what I'm thinking or maybe like that situation you mentioned, maybe they're wondering what the guy reading the magazine is thinking and they're one, maybe wondering why they're being ignored. You know how singers can be. Yep. Uh, so what I'm always looking for uh, is things that you might say to the artist that makes them want to perform for you so that I can do that before they get to you so that it's easier for you. You know, my, my, my lot in life now is, is a facilitator to, to help the singer and the producer get along and make a, a much better record because, the, like you said, the singer comes in prepared and the singer knows what you want and how you're going to try to get it. And so that's kind of where my question comes from. Yeah, I mean, the the, the biggest thing that I, I have a trouble getting out of a singer is to really go over the top and not, not be afraid to put themselves out there. And um, sometimes to get the best feeling and the, and the most punch out of a vocal, you have to borderline be, be cheesy with it, with your performance, almost like you're an actor. And, mm -hmm. and convincing artists that they need to be more like actors when they're in the booth and they're not to the point of musical drama theater but almost you know if, if they feel like they're almost musical drama theater it's probably just enough of that to give that performance to, you know that that really great thing and so many of them they're just they're working on the melody and staying in tune remembering the lyrics and that's about that's where it kind of ends and and if they could just lose themselves and over sing, and then that would be my 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 best gift ever is if I had to reel a singer back and be like, okay, that's almost too cheesy, pull it back now, and don't don't be so animated, you know? So yeah, get, like you can get, say like you know, just cut back ten percent, man, it's perfect, right? But it, it never happens. It's usually, you know, push out another fifty percent, and we might have it, you know? So. Getting them to be animated, if you can do that before they get in the studio, that's they have some winning vocal performances. Yeah, they're just they're very what I find is they're they're not used to the environment and uh so uh what I would you know th this is your thing and I'm I I wanna respect that. Uh what you might want to suggest to your clients is that they do as much you know, home recording as possible where they're wearing headphones and singing on a mic so sure. that they get they get comfortable projecting and not feeling like they have to hide. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, sounds like we're on the same page. I really appreciate your, your time in answering that question. Yeah, absolutely. Before Dwayne left, he typed up a little, a few questions. Um, 
He says, question one, vocal clarity, that R&B type. Um, some tips, please. Vocal clarity, R&B. Um, the R&B vocal clarity, it's, it's all about getting that high end open without it being brittle and, and sharp. And the way I achieve that is a mixture of multiband compression and, and just finding the right frequencies to boost. Sometimes it's boosting one and cutting another, so, so you might you might boost a bell at 12K, but then you cut 4.5K. And, and you, I call it trading frequencies. It's like you're substituting one frequency that's kind of sweeter sounding and more open for one that could also be open but a little more harsh. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it's just it, it, it's matching the right mic. And after that, if once that's done, just careful EQ of the high end. Um that's all it is. It it's just sculpting the high end for that sound. Um, <clears throat> as far as the R and B sound in particular, I think it it kind of has a scooped out mid range where a rock vocal would have a lot more mid range. Um, pulling out kind of the honky frequencies between eight hundred and and two K. Um, and like I said, I'm trying to get that silky high end. So. Okay. And he says he really likes that fantasy track, bro. Okay, cool. He <laughs> um, says, question two. Just kick and bass process. The gear plugins that no one uses, um, if that's a thing, he says. Um, it's not. I don't, I don't have stuff that, well, maybe one thing that no one else uses, but. It's not as so much of what I'm doing as, as to I mean what I'm using as to how I'm using it and and the choices I'm making and that's man it's just practice and doing things three and four times um, you know you EQ in a bass and then you get the kick in there and you can't fit the kick and and just being drastic with all your moves until you can get things to work together and not being afraid to pull everything down and pull the plugins off and start over or, or save as, you know, save your session as and try a second way. And if that doesn't work, go back to the first session. Um, and to get specific on bases, I, I typically, if a bass is even note-wise, it doesn't have, you know, notes that jump out. If it's pretty even, I'll use maybe that, the Wayne's pre child compressor on a live bass and then followed by a channel strip plug in. I really like the low end of the Metric Halo channel, uh, channel strip. Um, so I'll sculpt the bass with that. If I need a, a rock bass, sometimes I'll go with the, uh, uh, what is it, the CLA bass plug in that Waves makes. Uh, synth basses, sometimes I don't do anything. Sometimes I ride the fader to even the notes out. Um, sometimes a little bit of uh, shelf EQ on the low end and then picking out certain frequencies like the fundamental or harmonics to boost back up after I've lowered the low end with the shelf to tighten it. Um, and then kick drum. Most of my kick drum work is layering with my own samples that I've collected for years. If someone gives me a bass drum, I usually have that same bass drum or a better version of it that's already been EQ'd and compressed. A lot of times I'll just replace theirs with mine. Sometimes I'll layer it with mine. If they have a bass drum that has a really cool character but just no punch, I'll mix in a little punchy bass drum real quiet underneath it, and all of a sudden it sounds like I, I magically fixed their bass drum, and they don't even know I put another one in there. But um, Stuff like that, and then just... The thing about low end is the frequencies are so big, your moves have to be spot on. So if you boost 55 hertz when you really should have boosted 60, it can be all the difference in the world. The frequencies are measured in tens of feet. I think 20 hertz is 40 feet long, the actual wave to develop. Um, you know, so those moves are, are a big deal, and that's why low end is the hardest thing in audio. 
So it just takes a lot of practice. When you when your mix is pretty much done, and you've got everything that's really important to you in there, and then you're looking, you have this one more sound that needs to be in there, and the producer wants that sound in there. Uh, what's your thought process? Uh, what what are you making sure that you don't do when you have to put that sound in there? And what are you making sure that you do do or whatever? That's usually a situation where usually it's not a sound that's left over or, or maybe they'll email me a sound to add and for the first few sec seconds I'm frustrated but then my goal is pretty much to not ruin what I already had by adding that sound in and I don't know what, what that could be. It could just be something that's blended in real low and or I don't know if it's an important sound, then I, I might have to rework part of the mix if it's just a, a, a big new part of the song that they waited till the last minute to give me. Or That doesn't happen too often, but um, mostly the situation that happens is I'll have the guitars loud and the piano soft when in their mind they wanted it the opposite way. They wanted a piano loud and the guitar soft. So I'll have to make that change and when you do that sometimes all of a sudden now this other keyboard isn't right anymore or the string part is now sticking out too much so I'll have to go back and kind of rework those so it's, it's not the funnest thing in the world to have happen but yeah the um uh, mayor was talking about running things through his system and you had said earlier you might have 10 plugins on a track right yeah um, me also, and what I've noticed is once I, you get to a point where it's actually a little system, and, and I'm, I'm wondering, do you think this way when you're, when, you're, when you're mixing? So say I end up with 10 plugins, if I make a move on that first plugin, it's going through that whole system, and I actually open up several plugins at one time and make moves and think of them as a system, as one tool. Do you ever do anything like that, like, or consciously? Not really. I, I usually, if if I typically, the reason I might use so many plugins is because my my method of engineering is when I pull up a sound, I hear the finished version in my head, and whatever it takes to get that is what I'm going to do. And if I can't achieve it, then that's one thing, but. <clears throat> most of the time I'll find a way to achieve it. So if I pull up a bass and musically I'm hearing it, I'm hearing this great bass in my head, I'm going to pull out any plug-in that I need to to achieve that sound in my head. And going through a long list of plugins that I've put on a sound, I kind of just start with one and move forward. I, I rarely have to go back to a previous one if I do it's usually to make a move that's not going to affect the ones after it too drastically. Uh, the worst case where it would be is a gain change. Like if I go back to my first compressor and change the output or the input, then I might have to check now my DSers and my, my other gain plugins to make sure they're doing what they were doing already. They might now need a threshold adjustment themselves because now maybe I've lowered it and now they're not working as hard, so i got to adjust them again to get back to what they were doing. So. One of the things I do is I'll, like, you know how you do a, say you add an EQ and you boost, I don't know, say you boost six, you choose to boost 16K and above, right? Uh -huh. And this is an EQ that you add, you've added to a track last. That, when I do that, I also, like, I'll go back and insert that for, in the first slot, like, move things around, insert that in the first slot and see what that same boost will do going through all the compression and whatever because it's a different result, and sometimes yeah. I end up liking that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Palm, Palm Mute has a question for you. You ready, Palm? Mitchell? Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was uh, checking in earlier uh, in the live stream, but I couldn't join. And I heard uh, you were also working on K-pop, and I was curious, how do you in generally uh, approach over synthesized K-pop, the ones with the lot of auto tune, a lot of auto tune bypass automation, and how do you globally approach that? Um, the I've probably done 
20 or 30 K-pop songs now, and they they weren't really crazy with the auto tune. And I don't I don't know if that's just the producers that I worked for, um, or the labels or or, or who that uh, didn't really have too much crazy crazy automation as far as auto tune. What we just had was many many vocal stacks, like probably uh, upwards of 150 vocals. Uh, in the song, just layers after layers, and you'll have five lead singers and then five rappers on the same song, and they each have doubles and ad libs, and it just adds up like crazy. So it's it's really just learning all those parts as a mixer and and getting them all EQ'd and compressed and DS'd and set to the right level and deciding which ones are going to be panned which. That that's usually the process. Um, I think the the K-pop stuff I've mixed, some of it has even been K-pop R and B almost, uh, uh, as as as, and maybe a little less um, of the straight ahead pop. The the BTS stuff I did was was straight up pop, but yeah, they didn't have a lot of auto tune stuff on their vocals. It was a little more natural. And on a follow up question, you um, said something about blending samples before. Uh, usually, how do you approach this? Because something blending, something 30 dBs lower is obviously different than filtering something out and then placing it in the same volume area. Right. Uh, with uh, with drum sounds, typically I will try to keep the original sound and not replace it altogether. Um, usually, a sound was picked because it had a character, so if that character is missing when I, I turn it in the mix, they're going to, um, the producer or the, or the guy who programmed the track is not going to be happy, so generally I'll, I'll just layer either using uh, the Steven Slate trigger, and um, it's really just trying to get the, once the music is in place, getting the bass drum or the snare drum to do, do what I wanted to do, like for instance a snare drum, they could have a really short snare drum with no tail, and it has a cool character, but when you get the, you know, 15 guitars and keyboards and 20 synth tracks on top of that, all of a sudden it's just this little tick of a snare drum that has no weight to it, and, and it's it's no fun to listen to, and it's not really giving you a backbeat. So I might find some long, drawn-out, sustained snare sample uh, that has a longer tail to it and, and just ease that in and try to match the pitch and make it come across as the same drum, but now it's just a little bit longer, but almost indistinguishable. Uh, like the producer, if he's really focused, but he'll probably think I just did something with compression rather than added a sound. So that's usually my goal, or, or with a kick, trying to, if a, last night I had a kick that had this really cool room, slappy room sound and then this dirty mid-range but once the music was in, you couldn't feel it. It didn't move the speakers, and no matter how loud I put it, it just became more slappy. It didn't. It didn't. You didn't feel it in your chest. So I just found a, a real plain chest pushing kick drum to blend in with it, and it sounded like the same kick drum. It just magically suddenly had punch, and uh, that punchy kick drum was probably 10 dB down from the other one. Okay. That I just answers my question. Say bye to everybody. Okay. Cheers. I gotta go. Bye. Okay. Um, what misconceptions do you can you think of that people have when it comes to the Grammys? The Grammys? Yeah. That they're fair. <laughs> 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 Grammys are. Uh, they're voted on by a not so large group of people, and um, a lot of times people know that they're at least going to get nominated. Sometimes even while they're making their album, it's uh, very political, and uh, um, sometimes you can, uh, if you're working with an artist who's won seven times before and there's not a lot of competition that year, you can almost bet they're going to win that year. So it, it's a little less 
awesome. <laughs> and then, and it's great to receive one and work on something that, like that that gets recognized on that level. But the actual voting process, there, there's so many great projects every year that go overlooked because they're just not, they don't get in front of the right people to vote on them, you know. And there's not, there's not really a remedy for that. There's not a remedy for that yet. Whoa. Not really, because it can it can involve, you know, if you have Macklemore and Eminem and uh, Two Chains and and Little Wayne and Tech Nine, you know, and and those are the ones up for best rap album, and uh, you know the the Little Wayne album is highly anticipated. Everyone's talking about it, and uh, everyone else's album was maybe it just wasn't that good, but. Uh, Lil Wayne album isn't even out yet and the, the voting members of the Grammys are already considering it, you know. They haven't even heard it. So things like that happen. That That's a total made-up uh, scenario, by the way. But things like that happen. and um, Just like the Oscars, you know, someone dies that year that just put out a movie, they're probably going to get an Oscar of some sort. You know, it's, it's all of a sudden they're the best. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of things can be predictable with the Grammys. Um, it also depends on the category. The The deeper you get into uh, the more obscure genres and um, the awards that maybe aren't televised, the more honest and the more true they are. It, it's kind of the televised and top few categories. that, um, And they're not corrupt by any means. They're just not as fair as they could be, you know. I'm going to, I got a message, I got an email, I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and go to the Latin Grammys um, just to see the difference and experience it. Yeah. <laughs> and Ludwig has arrived. Ludwig has a hey. question for you. Hey, Bob. Hey, How's it going? Good, and you? Good, good. Welcome. Good, good to see you, man. Thank, thank you for taking time from your busy schedule. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Well, the question I had was related to to working with Latin music, um, specific not not the Latin Grammys itself, but in general. So, what has been your? You know, I work with a lot of Latin artists, so that's probably main of what I do. Yeah. Um, audio music that I do, but what has been your experience working with Latin music compared to you know to Anglo music or English speaking music? That you have found that it's been like you know like something that you need to consider when you when you're working with a Latin artist. It's it's almost it, there's two things. One is vocal clarity and level, and the other one is is not too much low end. Um, I'm known for a, a big low end on a lot of records, and um, when I've done work for like uh, Warner Latin in the past. They always kind of pre-warn me to go a little lighter than I usually do, um, and I guess that's just a stylistic. Uh, I, I don't know if it's because it was pop Latin music um, versus something else, um, or if that's just their label. They just want a little lighter, tighter, lowing. And then the main thing is vocals. Um, it seems like the vocals they always wanted them louder and as much clarity on all the syllables as possible where in American music you can kind of on some songs even even hide the vocal um, you know you get into some rock and rock pop music you can you can tuck the vocal into the guitars and almost have to strain to hear it and uh, and get away with that and uh, they definitely don't seem to allow that in Latin music so you have problem good. with do you have problems with civilians with the Latin with the Spanish? Say what? Do you have issues with the civilians on on the Spanish words? Um, I I just have to be careful not to over DS, because I I really like DSing, and uh, uh, like for instance on uh, Beto's project, I always had to back off my DSer when the producers came in, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, this is very civilian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks, thanks for your time for answering. Absolutely, the Charles. Are you ready with that question? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. Bob, question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, and you know, 
honing in on your on your craft and your skill, right? <laughs> and your and as this as the music industry and the sound changes, do you have a signature sound? And what is that signature sound? I don't know what the signature sound is. And can someone and can someone recognize your signature sound? More importantly, <laughs> yeah, I think someone can recognize it. I just don't know how to describe it. My, uh, I was having that discussion with an artist I just mixed, and he said my sound was a girthy laser focus, whatever that means. <laughs> and I don't know what that means, but um, I don't know. I like separation in all the instruments. If you put something in a mix, I assume you want to hear it. So if you give me 200 tracks, I, I'm going to work to make sure you can hear all 200 um, whether I have to do it with EQ, level, automation, whatever I need to to accomplish that. So clarity and separation is, is probably the the foundation of what I do. And then I've always loved drums and punchy low end and, you know, deep frequencies. And then I, I like a nice open high end. So kind of that smiley face EQ curve is probably another aspect of my sound. So put all that together and whatever you want to call that. <laughs> any uh, any favorite synths? Synths? Um, I like the Mofo. Well, uh, uh, any any favorite synths that you love to mix? Synths? Um, any any styles? Any any uh, you know sounds or? Ah, uh, man, I like everything. I I get bored when I mix the same thing too many times, so I like to hear something new. Like I was getting really worn out on the the massive sounds that everyone was was given for you know 2010 and 11, so that was nice when that went away. <laughs> I, just, I just like to keep it fresh, you know. Nice, appreciate it, man. Uh, Jason Hollowell. Am I saying his name right? Yeah. Did he ever? Did he come out with that? Or you still? No, we, we did a video and um. Now we're we have eight songs and we're uh, we're gearing up for some performances. Hopefully in October, I think we have two. And uh, I've been taking some meetings and we're probably gonna write a couple more songs. So we're just trying to get him out there. We, he's right now he's building his uh, YouTube channel and his Facebook. He's about to launch those with that first video. So we're gonna get him started pretty soon. Now this is your artist. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've been developing him for two years and uh, writing and producing the music, and he uh, writes the lyrics. There's one song we brought in a writer, um, but mostly it's just him and I. Um, yeah. So, kind of throwback, throwback pop, or th urban pop, I guess. And Max has three questions for you. Go ahead, Max. All right. Uh, again, I appreciate you hanging with us, man. Uh, I, I know you got to be getting tired and needing a break and everything. Um, uh, kind of a uh, going back to something that we had talked or that we had all talked about a little bit earlier. Um, you had mentioned that you uh, sometimes don't even really listen to the words. You're listening to the vocals almost like an instrument. Um, do you find that you do better with um, trying to mix in that respect that, that the vocal is just another instrument or do you really try to avoid that and, and mix more on what the lyrics are? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think I approach it more as an instrument. I, I grew up on instrumental music first, um, and I was never really a lyrical guy. I was never really into poetry. And so when I first listen to a song, I listen to a rough mix and learn what the song is about, strictly learning, listening to the lyrics. Once I know what the song means and what the title, how it interacts with the music and, and the lyrics and all that, then I... I there's really none, none of that that goes into the mix for me um, because usually the producer, if they want to connect a lyric to something musical or sonic, it's something done usually in a big way that the producer's already done. Um, so 
at that point, once I know what the lyrics are talking about, I kind of just treat it as an emotional instrument. And I know that the vocal's the king. That's why we're here. Yeah. So, um, I usually start with the biggest vocal sound I can and then start tucking it back into the mix till it's just in there enough to where it's not too big. And, um, I mean, even if you don't know the language, like I said before, you can feel when something needs to be brought out or when they're trying to be subtle, how they turn a phrase, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 I don't know, it's not, not too hard to, it's funny that you'd think you'd be a better mixer if you were paying attention to the lyrics, but as long as you get the song across in the end and you know what they're talking about, as long as you got it emotionally, I think that's the most important part. Okay. Um, which I guess that kind of uh, that kind of dovetails into what my next question is: is um, as a mixer, how often do you run into the issue where you're almost uh, in? in I, I, maybe you don't come across this working with the majors uh, because there's always a producer, you know, who's got a uh, a real tight control over you know what he's gonna let you do or what he's gonna ask for, ask of you as a as a mixer, but on uh, smaller projects, um, I find that I get tucked into this um, this pseudo producer role that I don't like getting into, uh, you know, because they're you know the artist will, you know is is the producer on the thing and then they'll say, well, what do you think? You know, and uh, I, I kind of have a, uh, not an unwritten boundary, but I kind of, I, I, you know, I don't like always making production suggestions. Um, how do you combat that? I mean, you know, or, or, or do you? The, the, the funny thing is the majors are less involved and the easier to deal with most of the time. No kidding. Actually, the reverse of what people think. The indie indie artist can be the most picky and most specific of anyone, and the indie artist hire you because nine times out of ten they need an engineer, and they know a handful, and you might be in their price range, and or maybe you're just so highly recommended they don't want to use anyone else, but then when it comes time to do their mix, they still want it the way they hear it in their head. Where a major, they're hiring you because oh I want that Bob Horn sound or I want that Dave Pensado sound. So we're going to go to Dave Pensato. So it's more like, Dave, do what you do, and then let's hear it. And we might change a couple of things, but we want that Dave thing. So, like, take, for instance, the six Usher mixes I did. I never met Usher. To this day, I've never, still never met him. Um, it was <laughs> me doing my thing, and then uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis telling me what to change, and then we were done. So... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like the the major labels actually opposite what a lot of people think. You you get paid wow. the most and you're left alone to do what you want the most. And a lot of a lot of uh, circumstances, uh, I'm sure there are some some exceptions. I've heard uh, some producers like Ron Fair, super producer. He's uh, very particular in what he wants, so I'm sure it varies. But um, back with the Indies, yeah, you get thrown into that producer role because they're looking for guidance and they might know you have experience more, more than they do. And, um, they want to know what you think. And I, I kind of embrace that. And I just, I, I mix how I hear it. And then hopefully I win that. I win them over, um, to where they don't try to dial me back into what they hear in their head. Um, cause otherwise they just need someone that, makes it sound good. They don't need someone that's trying to impart a sonic signature to what they're doing. So sometimes that can be a battle. I, I, I kind of embrace the producer part, though, because I, I I just, if I can have control and, and to making it the way I want it to sound, and I guess I'm just greedy like that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. when I'm in the producer role, you know, I, 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 I embrace it, but I, I didn't know if... Uh, yeah. You know, if it was more common to not want to have that that thrust upon you, or no, I don't mind because that usually means I can get stuff done faster than waiting on them to 
figure things out or decide when they don't have a decision. But I guess the frustrating one is when they ask you to make a change and then ask you what you think and what you thought was before they changed it. That was my thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, that's why I did it that way. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but other than that, I don't I don't mind it so much. Okay. Um. Now I I, I guess the uh, the the real million dollar question. Uh, you know. Uh, I I probably mix somewhat closer to you than I would say. Um, uh, Dave or even Dylan, okay. Um, in that I really like a nice, tight, punchy ass in. I mean, if if right. it's not got any thump in a rump, you know, uh, whether it's uh, rock or dance or uh, hip hop or pop or whatever, uh, you know, it's just got to have some some gas in the ass. Right. Um, what would you make as a suggestion for the easiest ways to to start trying to to dial that in a little bit better um, as far as that that you know every, everything from I would say 300 down sometimes just gets really confusing as far as you know what do I need to do to to really get that nice and tight where uh, you know where I can get that 40 and below to 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 actually have some impact right well the the thing about the low end frequencies are there's different functions in the different areas and specifically from 300 down if you're going for a chest thump which I would consider between 85 up to 1 150 at the highest right. and you have too much 300 it's it's gonna ruin that it's gonna make it sound ugly and you're gonna feel like maybe you've boosted too much and that's why I actually don't find myself using shelves very much at all. I, I use peaks, and I do a lot of what I consider W curves, where let's say I'll, I'll boost 90 to get that chest thump, or maybe that's where the one of the nice harmonics of the kick drum is. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, 110 is a little tubby because of that boost I've made. So I'll do a little cut above my boost, and then... Now maybe I brought up a little bit too much sub at 60 right. from that, and I'll do a little cut on each side, and it looks like a W. Oh and, yeah, okay. And okay. you end up with these these really tight uh, boosts that are really that's what we're looking for. It's like when you when you just take a pull tech, put it on 100 hertz, and boost it, it's big, but it's it's either too big or it's not big enough. You never get that cool tightness. Yeah. I think you gotta get in there after you've done that big pull tech boost and do some little surgical tailors, you know, to some of the uglier frequencies that you weren't intending to boost, you know, and if you're looking for that 40 kind of pillow sub thing and you have too much 80, that can, that can hurt you too. So, okay. and the only way to really know that stuff, because it's different on every single sound is to just, just fool around and experiment. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, really on every sound, just try something new. You know, try. You know, so I, I tell people just grab that EQ, boost it, and start moving it around, and find those magical areas, and you know, try ten different things till you get what you hear in your head. Okay, man, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, tell Dylan to take you out to Mucho Mas on me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I will. Bob, why H delay? H delay? Yeah. Why H delay? Yes. Why do you like H delay so much? Oh, did someone say I love H delay? Did I say I love H delay? Yep. <laughs> um, I love H delay for the ping pong effect it has, and for the filter that's built into it. Um, because generally when I do a delay I do not make I don't keep it full range low end and high end I um usually cut out some lows and sometimes highs sometimes both so if I use a regular like digi delay I'll end up putting you know a renaissance EQ right after it to do the filter but with the H delay it's all on one plugin which is kind of cool plus it has that uh, 
modulation chorus effect if you want a little bit of that. So it's just a real flexible delay all in one rather than having to, you know, string two or three plugins together. Okay. Um, besides cardioid, when you're recording vocals, what else um, do you use and why? Um, if you're, if you're, it's all dependent upon your booth or room that you're recording in. And if it doesn't sound amazing, I don't recommend anyone ever using anything other than cardioid. And sometimes their booth doesn't even sound good enough to be recording in. Uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, the comb filtering problems you can get just by having a piece of glass in them with a window. And uh, sometimes the music stand, the sound will bounce off the music stand back and then the mic, ten, you know, 10 milliseconds later and just ruin the vocal sound. And you'll swear there's some mid-range frequency that you need to take out and you can't find it because it's not, it's not a mid-range frequency. It's a comb filtering effect. So... To use something like Omni on a vocal, I would only do that if I was in a really nice studio or a booth that was just had no sound. Like I, we have two booths here at our studio that have zero sound to them. Like there's no character to them. There's no uh, reflections. They're just like dead, almost anechoic chambers. So we can use Omni, and it actually still sounds like a cardioid, um, and we can get away with it. The beautiful thing about using Omni on a vocal is lack of proximity effects you don't get that boomy vocal buildup but again if you're in a rough sounding booth or room it's gonna be worse because <laughs> you can never get rid of room sound in a mic the uh, ribbon mics what do you like about ribbon mics um ribbon mics i like uh i like them on guitars horns and uh sometimes drums and i guess I like them on horns because I like bitey brass sounds, but when that's done with condensers, it, it can hurt too much. And then you get in this battle with your EQ of trying to get it bright enough, but then it's too bright. And uh, It seems like with ribbons, you can get that sound that's a lot more comfortable on the ear. Um, with guitars, they just seem to be really big and beefy, so when you blend a ribbon mic, especially a distorted guitar, you blend that in with the 57, it kind of acts like an EQ. If you want more of the, the clarity and the, the bite, you turn up the 57. And if you want more of the warmth, you turn up the ribbon. And you kind of get this EQ with the two faders. Um, you know, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then percussion, if a, if a track is open, doesn't have a lot of overdubs, like something like um, Tom Petty type of folk music or open rock three-piece band, Ribbon mics are really nice on drums. They're darker, but they uh, they just have a realism hearing it through the speakers. That's that's pretty cool. All right, I'm getting a post from Pensado students. Damon Martin is asking. He says, "Mado Tep, can you ask Bob what his favorite surgical EQ is for general use? His go-to plug-in." Uh, there's two. One is Metric Halo Channel Strip, which you may not think of as a surgical EQ, but it's the fastest moving EQ. You, you just grab the dots and pull it up, pull it down, and you, you get to your you get to your decisions quickly, which I think is important with EQ. When you use something like a filter bank, which I consider a slow EQ, you have to set the frequency then you have to set the gain, then you have to go back to the frequency and fine-tune it, and then fine-tune the gain. You have to go back and forth with the metric channel strip. You just grab the dots, and you're, you're adjusting the gain and frequency instantly at the same time. You can arrive at your decision really quickly and then just fine-tune the bandwidth. Same thing with the uh, Bad Filter Pro Q. I love that EQ because it's, it's the same thing. You just grab the dots with the mouse, and you yank on them. And you find the spot, you know, that you hear in your head right away. Rather than if you, if you have to take time EQing, the longer you take, the more you fooled your ears, and the less likely you'll nail the frequency as far as from an ear training perspective. Um, and not to mention the, the Pro-Q2 has so many amazing features to it. Uh, that's just 
really a phenomenal piece of work. And it has a uh, now on the bells you can do up to 96 dB per octave curves. So you can literally do square curves on a bell uh, EQ band. So you can do some really really cool stuff with low end and and cutting frequencies that are annoying and you know stuff like that. Okay, I don't want this to be overlooked. You said something about moving fast with EQ. Why? Uh, because the the slower you are at adjusting your EQ and getting it to the right spot, the most likely, the more likely you'll be to miss miss it being perfect. So if if in your head you hear something's harsh at 1.2k and it takes you 15 seconds to get it there, you might set it at 2.5k and be off a little bit. And if you can just grab the gain and the frequency all at once, like you can with the fab filter, yank it right to the offending area and pull it down within a second and a half, you're going to nail that frequency. So for the guys that haven't been training their ears for 20 years, you know, they'll, they'll be more likely to get that frequency spot on. And not to mention those EQs have the spectrum analyzers in them, so you can kind of see what you're dealing with as well. Okay. What do you do in tracking that people tend to do in mixing these days? In tracking then? Um... That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I do. I uh, my tracking is very open. I don't I don't really compress I, vocals. I'll I'll compress if I have a transparent compressor. But drums, I don't do any compression on the way in. Um, I'll do EQ. Some people don't even do EQ, uh, which I'll do. But um, typically, I, I track stuff plain Jane and process heavy on the on the other side on the mixing side. Okay, you brought up live drums. That's perfect um, because we have a Pensati in here named Ludwig who's dying to ask you about live drums. So go ahead, Ludwig. Unmute yourself and um, hit him with the question. Ludwig, you have to unmute yourself. You know, technology, it still talks to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right, so so here here's something that I just went through not long ago. So I had um, this band. I was mixing this rock band, and they recorded all of the plays, recorded the drums in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Okay. Uh, because they like the the sound from one the rock band they have over there, and and then they recorded vocals and somewhere else, and then Colombia. And anyway, the fact about the drums is when they send the, the album um, to mix. It was about probably 22 tracks for the drums. Um, they have, my, you know, they have everything tra tracked. They have, um, you know, kicks, snares, overheads. They had a room, room mics. They have a stereo room mics. They have high room mic, low room mic, microphones. How do you, how do you approach that? I mean, I, I had, I had some trouble trying to, you know, it didn't have a lot of face issues, but but I did have some some trouble trying to get a good balance, get a punchy drum set, is rock, and in the snare to cut through, and you know a lot. Of, I mean five toms, so it, it was hard for me to first time that I have to go through so many tracks to get the drums. How how do you get that those type of, of recordings? Uh, yeah, you have to mix. When I when I receive a lot of. Uh tracks like that on a drum set, I, especially room mics, I try to weed out ones that I don't like and that are unnecessary. Um, it, it's, it would be rare that there'd be a good reason to have three sets of room mics. You're, you're at that point, you're giving three different time dimensions, uh, to the drum set. You're, you're giving us a close one, a medium one and a distant one. And when you add them all together, you're just smearing, the depth of the drums, it actually doesn't make that much sense. It's, it, what, what do you want it to sound like? Do you want it to sound like it's 15 feet? Do you want it to sound like it's 10? Do you want it to sound mono? Do you want it to sound stereo? So when I receive that many room mics on a drum kit, I usually 
choose the best two or the ones I feel fit the song. Even if I switch in the middle of the song in the bridge, I go to a different pair. I'll, I'll try not to use all of them. Um, and then as far as the toms, just cleaning up between the tom hits, I'll actually go in and erase the waveform when the tom's not playing and do crossfades, almost like you would gate the toms, but I do it manually with the waveforms. That way the toms are only playing when they're actually hit. Um, because there's so much mud and phase that that becomes part of the sound, and it's generally not not good. So most of the time, I only want to hear the stereo overheads, kick snare, and and that's about it. And maybe one set of room mics, and then when the toms are played, they come on. Otherwise, they turn off. Um, you know, so usually try to get it down to f five or six tracks being heard at one time, you know, rather than all 20, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's tough because, yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, overheads, I mean, they typically record as a hi-hat and then they call it a right uh, cymbal, so it, it's a lot of mics, and, and I, have yeah. to, I have to really weed out a lot of the room mics, and you're right, so I took them for dimension only, so it was yeah. on the drums. Like ride, ride cymbal mic, I, I automate. I only turn it up when the ride cymbal is being played. Otherwise, I turn it down. Um, Hi-hat, sometimes I'll leave it open on the whole time. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's a so lot of work. One of the things that I found is that one of the mics on, on the, one of the toms, I think it was a floor tom, was giving me a fantastic sound for the snare. <laughs> so it, it was it was when it was mixed with the snare, it was really punchy, clear, and said, Wow. I mean, and it's coming from the tom. And that tom wasn't even really playing much. So uh, what I was I have to automate it up to the center every time they will have to eat it then I'll just move it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but it was <laughs> Yeah. But it, it was it was fun though. It was fun. It was oh wow. I mean so I, I don't know. that's what I wanted to know. Well, how do you take it? What did you take on it? And on the on the overheads, do you compress them or you just leave them open? Uh, I try to compress them and see what it sounds like and if it uh yeah. the thing is compressing the overheads starts <laughs> to move the snare. So if it starts to ruin the snare sound then I, I take it off. But um I experiment with it. I, I always try it. Sometimes it doesn't work. It depends how close they were to the symbols and that kind of thing. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah. All right. It's time to wind it down. Um, well, for, well, before I ask this question, uh, hey, Roger, when your kids came in, we could tell that you, uh, you're the man of the house. <laughs> we were over here. Yeah. Hundred percent. Your kid, your your kid is on the video, so you can scroll to it and show him. But it was. Uh. Cool. It's clear that you're the man of the house because we were all over here cracking up. No doubt. Um, <laughs> huh, okay, Bob. Um, so we're about to um, wind down. Um, question for you. If if you walk into a situation and those tools that are in that situation are not tools that you're used to, um, compressors and whatever, um, what do you do? How do you handle that? Uh, I I I don't know. I mean, it's that's hard to happen these days. I mean, I guess it could, but if I mean, with Pro Tools rigs and portability, and so many people having the same plugins, and you know, I mix ninety percent in the box, um, so that I mean, that used to kind of be an issue choosing studios and arriving with a bunch of outboard gear, but that really didn't happen so much these days. But if it was, I'd. I don't know. I, I just kind of forewarn the client, you know, that that these aren't the best tools we could be using. But um, I don't. I think that could happen more in a tracking situation. Definitely, like lack of microphones or a bad recording room, um, and then you just gotta reach into your bag of tricks and and see what you can make work. You know. I walked into a studio and they had. Like I'm, I'm, I'm in the box. I'm not a guy who's had all the gear and all that stuff, right? So I walked right. in with all this gear that I was gonna have to use physical gear. I was like, oh crap! And it's like it's a every move I made was a learning curve. You, you know, <laughs> everything that that you it would have paid off to have you in there. 
Um, yeah, help me at out. that point, throw your hands up and hope <laughs> for the best. Um, and then, uh, let's see. When you get a rough mix that you think sucks, what do you do? Do you just start talking to the client and trying to, like, you just have this conversation with the client? Um, what do you do? If I get a rough mix that sucks, I'm happy because I know I'll be able to beat it. <laughs> that's that's the only thing I think about a bad rough mix. With a good rough mix, then I just worry, am I going to beat it? And I, you know, that's that's more of a concern if the rough mix is really good. Um, okay. If it's a bad rough mix, I might have a few questions like, do they intend for, you know, the piano to be so loud or you know something like that, but. Um, generally, a rough mix just means uh, it was done by the producer or the artist themselves, and they're just not, you know, technically minded person. Not a big deal. How do you actually hold that conversation with them um, without being offensive? Um, just pick your words carefully. Like in the in the piano situation, just be like, "Do you want the piano loud and up front like it is on the rough mix, or do you want it a little more tucked in?" You know, just how how you choose your words. I'm I'm asking because I I have a horrible time. <laughs> I have a horrible t yeah, I have a horrible time not offending people when I when I ask them stuff. You know, like when when their mix is that bad or when they're singing that bad. Um, I'm terrible at at that stuff. Talking to people, <laughs> not offending them. Well, uh, right. this anger management. Um, we'll practice things when you come intern. I would appreciate that. The so when a song yeah a song you get this song the song itself is horrible they want you to mix it do you actually tell them you need to re well yeah what would what do you do the, the song, song itself is horrible but they're gonna pay you good money to mix this song if the song is horrible but the production sounds professional sure and I did I might. I'm, I don't know. There, there's plenty of songs that have been hits that I thought were horrible, so I might I might just get through it and do it. If the production's horrible and the song's horrible, then I might tell them it's not a project for me or I don't, I'm not sure what to do with it, and I just might not want to be involved with it because it might lead to, you know, other clients knocking on my door that aren't, you know, with <laughs> lackluster songs. Can I say this, Mike? He brought back this mic from what, SAE? He went to SAE and got this mic um, from Blue. Them, bruh, this uh -huh. is dope. Is it good? I like this mic. You, you guys are showing off um, the the ribbon mics from the guy with the hat. I keep keep hey, Dooley. Hey, hey. From Wes Dooley. Yeah. And, um, so it's, I've never had a ribbon mic. I want to get a ribbon mic. Um, as a matter of fact, what does... Dooley has a whole assortment of ribbon mics, right? Right. Yeah, that's all that's they all do. Does. Yeah, Brian's sitting there saying that's all he does. Brian's made it back. Um, I need to get I, – I, I want to get something like an old-school sound, warm, transients aren't jumping at me. Um, is that – am I going down the right track if I get a ribbon? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Then, yeah, I want, yeah, if you get an AEAR92, that's what you want. All right, you're recorded on here saying as saying that, so I can always come back. But um, I really like this mic. Um, I used it on rappers and singers so far. Okay, um, information on you, Bob, which we should have did this in the in the beginning. What's your website? Uh, BobHornMixing.com. BobHornMixing.com. Echo Bar Studios. What's the website for that? EchoBarStudios.com. And who's all in there with you right now? Dave. Uh, Dave Pensato, Eric Rikers, and Cole Nystrom, and myself. And <laughs> what what mic is that? What? One of the guys is showing up, showing a mic. Right, Max is showing a mic. Oh, Fet Forty Seven. I think JJ Audio is going to do a a, a Pensato students uh, buy on a mod, um, where he's going to emulate the the Fet the Forty Seven. Oh, okay. Wait, he, yeah, Norman 47. Um, okay, we're about done. Well, we're done. Bill, Bill Kamek, I just saw you show back up. Do you have anything for Bob before we head out, if you're still there?
That's for you. It's for me. Uh, oh, yeah, no. Nah. Buy it, right? No, it's yours. Okay, it is now documented in, in, in law, lawyers. He just gave me this microphone. It's the, the reactor microphone, so if he comes and hunts me down later, he's giving it to me for free. Are you serious? He walked away. I'll be down. Yours. No, he just gave you the case. Oh, yeah, huh? I better check. <laughs> Bill, did you have any, um, did you have anything for Bob? No, no. As, as usual, um, Bob, I think you've been one of the uh, amazingly informative people that have been on Pensado's place. There's another one of those situations people are going to have to rewind and keep going back and try out all your techniques. So just thanks a lot again. I, I appreciate you guys having me, and we can do this again sometime soon. Absolutely. Bro, i got to pay you for this. This is This is... He actually gave me this microphone. I'm sitting here tripping. I, I, all I heard was, you got to pay me, and you looked at me. <laughs> That's all I saw. Wow. Okay. Um, I guess we're done. This has been an awesome hangout. I end up with a microphone that I really like. The bomb. Yeah, okay. So, anybody have any questions for Bob before we head out? Hey, Bob. Supposed to raise your hand, Roger. Hey, what's, like this. What's, what's a guy? What's, what's a guy got to do to get one of your songs to master just as a trial? Uh, <laughs> um, email me, uh, <laughs> and we'll find something. All right. Yeah. We'll do it. Anybody right. else? Cause we're we're oh, about me. to. Oh, me. one. Go ahead, Morris. Hey, so Bob, when I um when I I'll, I'll inbox you. We already friend on Facebook, so I'll inbox you. Okay. When I come to LA, I'm gonna try to look out, but I won't do nothing but sit in the back and buy food. Awesome. And, good. Okay, and Bob, do you have any information you want to give out before we head out? Uh no, I, we'll just have to do this again sometime. All right, yeah, bro. We we were sitting here talking, texting over here like Bob's looking sleepy. Like, yeah, Bob. Hey, October, Bob. I'm I'm there. <laughs> nice. Look for me. All right. Okay, bro. Much appreciated, Bob. This was an awesome hangout. We like Bill said. We really are gonna have to rewind this. Uh, you know, go back and watch this several times. I know that I've missed stuff because when I when I watch the ones that are intense like this, half the stuff that's said you don't even realize how good the information is that was said. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to go watch this tonight again. This is good. We've been going about four hours. Wow. So, four yeah. hours. Oh, so you can, you know, I guess we, uh, I owe your lady an apology when I see her. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm the guilty one. <laughs> All right, Pensado students, everybody out there, Eric Riker, we're coming after you sooner or later. We're going to hunt you down and get you on here, hold you hostage. Um, again, thanks a lot, Bob. Yeah, thank you. I'll talk thank to you guys you, soon. Bob. Thank you.